I hate New Year's Eve. Every year on this night, the anomaly comes back. It first appeared in the sewers of my hometown five years ago. The only hints we had of its existence were two dismembered teenagers and one young girl who'd been traumatized into a permanent silence. At the time, disturbing as the events were, it was hard for the police to justify spending resources on kids that had been deemed undesirables. The questions focused on what the three had been doing in the sewers on New Year's Eve, not on who or what had killed the two boys, and the terrified new girl couldn't answer them in either case. We didn't have much to do in my town other than drink, so our debates at the bar went in circles before fading over the next few months. We were collectively just about to forget the whole thing when the next New Year's Eve rolled around. The night's celebrations were rowdy, sure, but slightly overshadowed. More than a few people had theorized there might be a serial killer who had chosen that night annually for his ritual. We all kept a nervous eye on the shadowed distances outside the reach of street lamps and porch lights. And just after midnight, screams echoed out from a back lot behind the back of the hardware store. A tremendous burst of drunk, angry, and protective men surged from the Main Street bars, myself among them. We amped up all night to potentially mass mob a serial killer, but none of us were prepared for what we saw. Four limbs, a torso, and a head lay scattered around the lot, but not even in pieces. Some tremendous force had sliced them to bits. Worse, the same mute girl from the year before sat huddled behind a dumpster, crying and covered in a sopping wave of blood. Harold, our oldest homeless man, had been murdered, and that girl had become their primary suspect. The police took her and brutally interrogated her. Our town was simultaneously silent and full of whispered gossip for the entire time. Nobody knew whether to feel bad for her or whether to demand she be... <clears throat> Nobody knew whether to feel bad for her or whether to demand she be treated more fairly. If she had killed those people that way, she was totally insane. So I fought down my usual urge toward fairness and stood by while they continued hurting her. We all did. Apparently, after four days, she finally cracked and told them what she'd seen both New Year's Eves. We could only guess at this, though, because the chief of police left the station with a haggard look of suspicion and fear without a word. The other cops escorted the girl to the psych ward of our local hospital and left her there indefinitely. They looked for a hypothesized serial killer for a few months, but neither scene held any forensic evidence. They were forced to give up. Not that it mattered. The next New Year's Eve, they were all killed just after midnight. A veritable cyclone of gore and grated chunks exploded across Main Street. I was sitting in Roddy's pub with the other guys when the window suddenly went dark red with blood like rain. The thump scared the living daylights out of us and we ran to the door when we realized all the windows were opaque. I... I can't describe the scene outside. Suffice it to say, the sewer drains nearly overflowed. Our entire police force, several doctors, and numerous patients from the psych ward were later pieced together out of the morass. Sitting dead center was the same girl. Knees curled up, arms over her head, as foot-deep blood swirled past her. Yet again, she'd been the only survivor. Only this time, we knew we were not dealing with a serial killer. Something far worse was happening. The girl, of course, had more or less lost her mind. 
She was also still drugged up from the ward and told us everything in a stunned haze. I wish she hadn't. The nature of the anomaly was such that we could not speak to the media or ask for help from outside sources. We simply wouldn't be believed and there would be more questions than answers, getting us all in deeper trouble. Though the mess was horrendous, we cleaned up the street as best we could and gave them all good Christian burials. Those hours of picking up body parts with my numb garbage bag gloved hands in the cold light of New Year's Day rank among the second worst day of my life. We were all in it now. A town secret among the men. The anomaly was going to come back and we had to be ready. Part of me hoped it wouldn't return, but the rest of me knew with a sick feeling that it would. It had been growing bolder each year, starting underground and then slowly moving into places that were increasingly public. If we didn't stop it, Lord knew where it would go next. Last New Year's, we sat waiting in our houses. There was no drinking, as we'd have to be sharp. There was no gathering, because it would find us. There was no last-minute goodbyes or phone calls. We didn't intend to die. It came between one blink and the next, just before midnight, and just as the poor girl had said. She was my first sight. This would be her fourth time through this nightmare. She didn't scream. She didn't move. She seemed completely resigned to her fate. Recovering from the blurry, odd feeling of being taken, I looked around at the others. There were the 43 men we'd expected, the girl, and several wives and children. My heart sank as I saw them. Someone had screwed up. Beyond our scattered group, strange ivory tiles radiated out to meet smooth alabaster walls that arced around us in an unbroken circle. The ceiling, just reachable by a jump, held the same tiled pattern. I took this in quickly, then focused on the anomaly at our center. It was as she'd said. Six thin black circles rotated on an axis to form the framework of a sphere shape. Each circle seemed to be made of impossibly thin material, like a fine wire honed into razor blade sharpness in every dimension. An ivory sphere hovered inside of it. Blank. There was very little delay for getting our bearings. The ivory sphere lit blue while people were still cussing and looking at each other. The girl screamed to make them pay attention, and we looked down at our feet. A large number of the semicircular tiles on the floor had turned blue. I touched one, and it rose about a foot up and turned green. Getting the idea, everyone else started running around and hitting the blue tiles, raising them up and turning them green while the sphere began humming louder. As it reached the crescendo, we realized that all the tiles had been activated, but we weren't sure if that was what we were supposed to do. Apparently it wasn't, because the sphere reached a high note, went silent, and altered one of its surrounding black circles. The circle rotated until it was flat in the air, and then began expanding rapidly. People screamed, but we all ducked in time. We'd all seen what this thing had done to everyone else. We weren't about to get caught off guard. The worst injury was the removal of a small tuft of hair from old Benson's mop. We crouched, relieved, until the lights on the floor changed and the humming began rising again. All these factors and certain details of the room I can't relate to you told us the terrible truth. It was a puzzle, exactly as the girl had told us. A child's puzzle, built by someone or something so exotically different from us that we found it murderous rather than simple. There were no instructions. The same way we don't put instructions on, say, a plastic tower with several brightly colored concentric rings of different sizes. 
The child was simply expected to try different permutations and have fun with no danger involved, but our ringed tower toy would seem very different to, say, a creature lethally allergic to plastic. You might ask, why would anyone make this? What monsters would create such a torture device? And we asked those questions too, as we failed to figure out the addition of red to the tiles. The second black circle around the sphere split into numerous vertical lines that began spiraling throughout the room. Mercifully, these were slow, and only a single hand was lost among the crowd. One of the wives screamed in pain, but her husband was there to bandage her stump, stem the bleeding, and grab her loose hand for possible reattachment. Assuming we got out of this in time. The ceiling. The ceiling tiles were separate objects from the tiles below them. As the sphere began humming again, we all realized at the same time. Jumping up, we hit red tiles, which turned blue and lowered. Below, we hit green tiles, which rose further and turned back to blue. The new color, yellow, only turned white when struck. The men threw out numerous theories. Did it have something to do with primary colors? Were we supposed to make patterns? The two black waves had halted at the extremities of the circular room. Should we try to take advantage of the new small gaps in the sphere's defense and destroy it directly? Whatever we were doing wasn't working. The girl warned us that the deadly black energy lines could come back from the outer walls, so we all managed to duck as the first ring shot inward and rejoined the sphere's outer shell. We all thought we were getting somewhere. We all thought we could figure it out. Maybe we could have given it enough time, but... When we looked around for the fourth change, we, we saw nothing new. Mary Baker stepped out onto a white tile and it rose and turned blue. The game hadn't been designed for us. There was only one chilling conclusion, something that not even the thrice surviving girl had known. The puzzle involved colors we couldn't see. It hadn't been built for our eyes. Collective hysterical screaming drowned out everything else. Our plans and strategies suddenly seemed stupid and ill-fated. We literally had no way to win. Every single person in that strange otherworldly trap. They were going to die. Except there was one other catch. A sort of fail-safe. I suspected it was the way the girl had survived three times already, and I was certain she'd kept it to herself on purpose. It was why I'd brought a knife and a gun, both hidden in my clothes. None of us intended to die. But I intended to die the least. The game led out in the middle of deep back country woods. Initially, I thought that this meant the anomaly was simply moving on a straight line to nowhere. Later, I'd realize that it was actually halfway to the state capital. There was no gore explosion this time. The black lines of energy hadn't torn apart nearly as many victims as before. All the blood and organs and intestines were still in the dead, held mostly together by their empty vessels. As the only survivor, exhausted and covered in blood myself, I walked straight home and took a shower. My first thought was not to tell anyone. I could never explain the disappearance of all those people, and certainly not a clearing in the woods filled with a dozen of bodies. You see, though the anomaly was built as some sort of puzzle for a child from a species unlike anything we could imagine, it was designed to be a multiplayer competition. The game automatically ends when only one participant is left. I kept this burden, this nightmare, trauma, and guilt to myself for an entire year. But tonight I speak. Maybe I've lost my mind. I did think I could live with this and keep the secret to myself, just as the girl thought she could. She only cracked once the first time and told Harold the homeless man. The police beat it out of her and sent her to an asylum. The cops, the doctors, and the other patients paid the price. We men heard it from her, and some of us told our wives and children, consigning them to death. 
That's another complication of being from a totally different culture than the anomaly. Just talking about it acts as an invitation to the yearly game. And we just don't know how to turn that invitation off. It might be as simple as a spoken phrase or a mental rejection in a particular manner unknown to us, or it might be something that requires organs or perceptions we don't have. In any case, this year, tonight, I speak because I have no idea what might happen if I'm the only player. I tell myself, we can figure out the puzzle if we have enough people, enough smart people, enough different people, that maybe someone has an inspiration, or maybe someone has eyes that can detect the unseen colors, but Tell the truth. I want as many people possible. Because I'm scared. I'm scared. And I'm sorry. Happy New Year's. I'll see you at midnight. I took the picture of Jody Cowanthrope. You know the one. It was all over the papers when she went missing. Her pretty blonde ringlets and apple blossom cheeks followed you everywhere you went for the first two years, always hoping she'd turn up. When she was pronounced legally dead, her parents held a memorial service. It was my picture they used in place of a casket. No dead body to lay to rest, just memories and dead in hopes to fill the empty spaces. Of course, at the time, I didn't know I was taking her very last picture. I was an amateur photographer, and I'd set up shop in the local mall for the day. Just a few lights and some backdrops. I didn't charge much because I was hoping to expand my portfolio and one day become a real professional photographer. I spent the day taking pictures of a few teenage girls, some kids, one or two adventurous mothers, and Jody course. I remember her most vividly of all. And not just because of her disappearance shortly afterwards. It was because she practically bounced into my arms, all bubbly joy and pink frills. I know most five-year-olds are probably like that, but with Jody it seemed different. I guess I'm not explaining it well. <laughs> I've kept my thoughts on this subject Mostly to myself. I used to have this horrible feeling that her kidnapper must have felt the same way about her, and that's why he chose her instead of someone else. Doesn't matter. The point is, shooting Jody was a joy. She did everything I told her exactly as I told her to do it. She was the perfect model. I spent almost an hour with her, and at the end of the session, her mother paid me double my rate just because she loved how happy my pictures made Jody. All in all, it was a successful day for me. Which is why I was not expecting the police to come knocking at my door two nights later. Unofficially, I was a person of interest. Being one of the last people Jody interacted with, I guess it makes sense that they suspect me, but it didn't take long for the cops to decide I had nothing to do with it. I had a solid alibi for the night of her disappearance, and my DNA wasn't found at the scene. Apparently there'd been a struggle in her bedroom, and they'd found some DNA that has never been identified. At any rate, they did come and ask questions. And wanted copies of all the pictures I'd taken of Jody, which I was happy to provide. They chose the best of the bunch. A cute picture of her sitting with crossed legs and a beaming smile to put into all the papers. And the rest, as they say, is history. They credited me with the picture. I thought that was kind of... Strange, to be honest, but it wasn't all bad. I have to admit, I got a lot of interest after that. Do you know how many people wanted to be photographed by me and were actually willing to pay? 
It was like I'd become some kind of morbid tourist attraction and people obsessed with mysteries and true crime stories. I sort of left a bad taste in my mouth working with those people, but they paid good money and I figured it wasn't really hurting anybody. Better they come bother me than go after her parents, right? Of course, I also got some hate mail from people convinced that I'd murder her. But those were few and far between. Eventually, the fervor around her disappearance died down, and I faded into obscurity. My photos got better, and I really did become a professional photographer. Made enough money to get by and everything. Once in a while, I'd get a question about Jody. What was she like? Did I sense something was off about her? Did I have any idea that... Something terrible was about to happen. But it became increasingly rare as time went by. This year is the 10 year anniversary of Jody's disappearance. There was a big article in the paper for her. People on the streets were whispering about her. What do you think ever happened to Jody Callanthrope? She was on our collective minds as the most famous mystery to ever come out of our sleepy little suburb. I should have been expecting a resurgence of interest in my photograph, but I wasn't, and it came as a surprise when he came walking to my store. He looked to be in his mid-thirties, with thinning brown hair and pale skin. He was about my height, just under six feet, but he walked with a slouch that made him look smaller. He was wearing these old Coke bottle glasses and kept fidgeting with them as he talked. I, I I was wondering, are you James Winterstein? As in the James that took that picture of, uh, of Jody? I nodded and gestured for him to sit down in my little waiting room. Uh, yeah, that's me. What about it? I could tell he had questions, but he didn't seem to know where to start. I waited patiently while he gathered his wits. I was just wondering, how how did you, how did you manage to do it? A red flag went up in my mind. Did this guy think I'd kidnapped her? (laughs) Of course he did. Just my luck, one of those delusional vigilantes had come to my shop to harass me. My voice came out harsher than I intended when I asked, What are you talking about? How did you manage to uh, capture her spirit so well, eh? He asked in a rush, oblivious to my abrupt change in tone. I mean, every time I see it, that picture of her in the papers, I, I get goosebumps. Looks like I could reach out and touch her. Was there some kind of, I don't know, technique that you used? A special camera? What was it? I relaxed a little at that. His curiosity seemed genuine enough. I didn't do anything special, I said with a shrug. I just told her how to pose. She brought the life to the pictures all of our own. He nodded a little, looking wistful. Yeah, that sounds like Jody, all right. You knew her? I asked. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I was her next door neighbor for a few years. Jody used to play in my yard. Sweet little kid. Terrible what happened to her. I nodded, and we chit-chatted for a bit after that. Just as he was leaving, he asked, Do you think you could take some pictures for me if you have the time? Sure, I said. What do you want? If you give me your card, I can email you the details, he said. I gave him a business card and sent him on his way. Didn't think anything of it. Not until that night, when I got his email. The subject line was an address. In the body of the email, it simply said, If anyone can bring her back to life, it's you. 
suddenly my interaction from earlier in the day didn't seem so innocent. Like a new lens slipping over my eyes, I relived every moment of our conversation. And I didn't like what I was seeing, not one bit. I'm not in some kind of shitty B-horror movie, and I'm not stupid, so the first thing I did was call the police. 911, what's your emergency? Hi, uh, my name is James Winterstein, and I got a weird email, and I know how it sounds, but I... I think it's connected to the disappearance of Jody Callanthrope. The operator sounded bored as she answered. I'm sure I wasn't the first person to call about Jody. They probably had a lot of wackos over the years who thought they'd solved the mystery of Jody's disappearance. Can you tell me what's in the email, sir? Uh, well, it's from a guy who came into my photography studio this morning. I'm the guy who took Joey's picture, you know, the one that runs in the papers. And he came in asking me some questions about it. Just now he sent me an email with an address and told me that if anyone can bring her to life, it's me. The operator was quiet for a few moments and I had time to think about how painfully crazy I sounded. What was the address, sir? I repeated it to her. More silence. Sir, where are you now? Uh, I'm at home. Why? Please, stay where you are. We'll send an officer as soon as we can. Do not leave the house. Lock all doors and windows. What? Why? What? What's happened? Please remain calm, sir. Give me your address and we'll have someone out to you as soon as we can. I gave her my address and hung up the phone, frustrated and unsettled. For one fleeting moment, I considered getting into my car and checking out the address anyway, but immediately put it from my mind. I'm not some kind of hero. I knew better than to get involved in whatever the fuck was happening. Two hours later... An officer came by and insisted I come with him down to the police station where I sat down and was questioned by two other officers for about half an hour. At the end of it, one of the officers, Officer Elroy, took me aside and finally explained what was happening. Earlier this evening, we received a tip-off about Jody. Someone was claiming to have seen her around the dress you gave us. The address belongs to a dilapidated cabin down in Woodred's Grove. When we arrived, we found her. My heart skipped a beat. You, you found Jody? She, she's alive? Officer Elroy gave me a sad look and I felt my heart sink. No, son, she's not. She's been dead at least three days now. We'll have to do a DNA test to confirm the identity of the body, but at this point, we have no reason to believe it's anyone other than Jody Callum the Rope. Shock numbed me to the core. You mean, this whole time she, she's been here? In town? All, all these years? He sighed. Most likely. It's more common than you might think. The man you saw earlier this evening, we think he's connected to her death and her kidnapping. We're going to do everything in our power to find him. If he's in contact with you again, we need you to contact us immediately. He wasn't there? At this scene? He shook his head. The numbness left me and anger boiled in my chest. I want to see her, I said. He opened his mouth, probably to refuse me, but I insisted. I was one of the last people to see her alive. I just... I want to see her. Please. Eventually, he shut his mouth and nodded. I followed him to the morgue. Before her parents had seen her, or even before... <sighs> I followed him to the morgue. Before her parents had seen her, or even been informed of her likely discovery... 
I pulled down the sheet and I looked into the face of a girl I would have recognized anywhere, even after all these years. I could see where her rosy cheeks had faded, her charming smile had thinned into a permanent frown, her liveliness had drained into endless exhaustion. It was Jody. And then again, it wasn't. I stared at her for at least ten minutes. And then I turned around and left. The next few weeks were, to put it simply, a shit show. Jody's parents were, of course, devastated, and the entire town was in shock. My phone was ringing off the hook. More obsessive freaks wanting to ask me questions about Jody's pictures. I ignored the phone, closed down the shop, and sat in my room. I drank, mostly, and tried to forget about the world, just to get away from it all for a little while. I did talk with Jody's mother a little. She'd kept in sporadic contact with me since Jody's disappearance, and I thought it sometimes made me uncomfortable. I couldn't find a way to shut her out. I always sort of felt like I owed it to her to be there for her, even though it wasn't my fault, and there's no way I could have prevented it. She asked me to come to the funeral, the real funeral. I kept trying to think of a polite way to decline, knowing I wouldn't be able to, knowing I'd end up suffering through it. The cops checked up on me once or twice, kept tabs on me to make sure that her kidnapper hadn't tried to contact me again. He didn't, of course. Not dumb enough, I guess. I went to the funeral, and I cried for a little girl that I never knew. I took some more time off work, but eventually opened up shop once more. Jody's parents sold the house and moved a few towns over. Can't say I blame them. Would you say if this had happened to you? Life went back to normal. At least as normal as it ever can be after something like that. But normal became a thing of the past this morning. Because this morning I opened my email like always. I skimmed the subject lines until I focused on one that had been sent in the late last night and paused. Written there in black and white was my very worst nightmare. I'm still waiting for those pictures. I really don't think this is so smart, a young woman no older than 21 said. The fear and anxiety rang clear in her voice. I'll be fine, a male voice responded. He took her soft, delicate hand in his and kissed it gingerly. It's nothing more than some locals who want to scare an out-of-towner. I'll do this tonight, and I'll be back at the dorm by tomorrow afternoon. His voice was self-assured, confident. He knew he had nothing to worry about. Sadness filled her eyes. I'm local, remember? I grew up hearing about this place. It scares the hell out of me. Clay, please don't go. Tears began to form in the corner of her eyes. I have to, Courtney. He dropped her hand, feeling himself becoming annoyed. If I don't, I'll be ridiculed until graduation. I don't believe in any of this crap anyway. You don't have to. This place... It's just evil. Are you going or not? Another male asked. He and his two counterparts sat, leaning against the trunk of the car. Shut up, Dale! Courtney snapped at him. Her curly brown hair fell into her eyes and she blew it aside. I'm trying to talk him out of it. Do what you want, Dale replied, his smile wide, baring his crooked teeth and spit. A small brown trickle of tobacco juice slid down his chin. But we're about to leave. You can come back to campus with us, take Lay's car and leave him stranded, or take that walk through the woods and stay with him. The choice is yours. Corny turned back to Clay. 
Her green eyes were pleading with him, begging him to call off this bet. There's no changing your mind, then. Clay merely shook his head. She nodded in understanding. Taking his face in her hand, she kissed him passionately. I expect you to call me as soon as you're back in your car and on the way home. Clay smiled. Yes, ma'am. He looked at Dale. Where is this place? Dale stood, followed silently by his lackeys, walked to his car door and opened it. Pointing over the roof of his car into the darkening woods, he said, Walk straight that way, you'll see it. He sat in the driver's seat. A moment later, his engine roared to life, the exhaust forming a cloud on the dusty road. Courtney walked to the car. Taking one last distressed look at Clay, she got in the car. From the rear window, she watched as they pulled away. Clay forced himself to turn away and looked into the forest ahead. The setting sun cast eerie shadows throughout. The last hints of autumn sun, low in the sky, peeked through the near-empty branches and seemed to set the trees aflame. Fallen leaves rustled and cracked on the ground as some unseen animal scurried about. A chill went up his spine. With a deep breath, he stepped into the thick of trees. He listened to the leaves crunch as he stepped closer to his destination. The forest was silent, void of any bird or insect calls. From above, a wind rose, howling through the branches high above. As the last rays of light began to falter, he pulled out his flashlight and switched it on. The howling wind continued, adding fuel to the ominous settings. <sighs> Calm down, Clay, he said aloud, as he felt his nerves begin to rattle. It's just a series of creepy events, fueled by those hicks and their ghost stories. Nothing more. After walking for almost 20 minutes, the building finally began to come into view. The pea farm an old abandoned prison just outside Shreveport. Supposedly, according to Dale at least, this place had housed violent criminals back in the early 1900s and had been closed in the 60s or so. The lesser offenders worked fields during the day and stayed in smaller buildings by the side, leaving only the most disturbed and violent to the main building. Dale had went on to say that the basement contained an old electric chair, one that was powered by a hand crank. He dismissed this last fact as pure fiction. One of Dale's underlings, Mac or Mike or Max, he couldn't remember the kid's name, said that the owners of the land couldn't sell it because of the large number of bodies that had been buried throughout the yard. This he had also dismissed as a fallacy. What he saw now, he didn't find impressive. He lifted the camcorder in his hand, a small Sony with a built-in hard drive and a battery that claimed to last two days, and switched it on. This was his means of proof that he'd stayed the night. No one, including Dale, was willing to stay with him as a means of verification. The red light flickered on, and the small LCD screen jumped to life, casting a pale light on Clay in his surrounding area. He passed the lens over the dilapidated building and then turned it to himself. Is this it? He said to the camera. Seriously? I thought you said this place was scary. I'm going to walk around outside a bit. Maybe explore the smaller buildings. And then I'll go into the main one. He smiled. So, come along as I take this trip, he said, giving his best version of a television narrator. Walking around the main building, camera in hand, the smaller housing quarters came into view almost immediately. They were small and unimpressive, more like boarding houses than prisons. He supposed that was why the lesser criminals were kept there. They were the trustees of sorts. The buildings were overgrown with vines and other foliage, and now dying as autumn pushed on. A tree had fallen through the roof of one of the houses, bringing down two of its walls with it, leaving nothing but a pile of rubble, broken brick, and twisted, rusted metal. 
Clay walked up the steps to the other, intact building. The windows were covered by a frame that once held bars, long since cut away for some unknown reason. Placing a hand on the door, he pushed it open. He winced as the door screeched and whined as the rust on the hinges scraped against metal. The scent of stale air and dusk struck him as he walked inside. What little moonlight there was outside was absent within the building. The darkness pushed against his flashlight, threatening to envelop and consume him. Dust flitted upon the air, then wafted back toward its resting place. Vines hung from above, almost threatening to wrap him up and strangle him should he become entangled within. Broken pieces of plaster covered the floor, while some hung precariously from the ceiling above. I'm telling you now, Dale, he spoke to the camera. If I get tetanus, poison ivy, or even rabies from some woodland creature, we'll have a serious problem. He began to feel an eerie feeling of being watched. Another chill ran up his spine as he continued to trek further into the building. As the minutes ticked away, he began to feel the effects of the stories he had been told. Despite his skepticism in the supernatural, his mind reeled at the endless possibilities at what lie just beyond the scope of his light. He shook the thoughts from his head and pushed on. There was no chance in hell that he was letting those bumpkins get over him. Clay turned to the side, shining both the light and the camera into various cells as he passed them. Water dripped from the ceilings, which hung low under the weight, and splashed softly into puddles collected on the floor. The cell bars had rusted and oxidized, leaving them a greenish tint. Small cots bolted to the floor and wall held ripped mattresses, stained with water, mildew, and God knew what else. Paint bubbled and peeled away in flakes from the brick walls. A thump from above caused Clay to jump. He turned the light and camera, it was now habitual to turn them in unison, toward the ceiling. Small clouds of dust puffed from the broken plaster. Another thump, another puff of dust and falling debris. Clay looked to the camera. So, you left someone here to try and scare me. He quickly made his way to the end of the hall and turned up the stairs. Once on the stairs, he slowed his pace, trying his best to remain silent. Switching the camera to night vision, he clicked off the flashlight and shoved it into his pocket. Through the LCD screen, he viewed the world in shades of green and black. He had to admit to himself that he didn't care for it. The darkness had closed in around him. He could feel its weight crushing him, threatening to squeeze the very life from him. At the top of the stairs, he panned the camera around, trying to find the would-be prankster. The room appeared to be empty. Not satisfied with this, he began a slow trek down the hallway. The floor was full of holes, results of water rotting the interior of the building. He almost screamed as a flash crossed across his camcorder screen. He quickly pulled his light from his pocket and passed it over the room. There was nothing to be seen. <laughs> it had been merely his imagination, he finally decided. He inhaled deeply, trying to regain his composure. <laughs> he almost lost it there, he told himself. A thump from beneath his feet caused him a small yelp to escape from his throat. He could feel himself becoming annoyed with the situation, with Dale and his friend's little antics. Had Courtney been involved? She left with them. It would take several hours to drive to the LSU campus to drop her off and then drive back to play these games. He'd only been alone an hour. Maybe an hour and a half. That meant she had to be with them. He felt anger surging within him. Maybe her begging and pleading was just an act meant to rile him up, jingle his nerves. Maybe... She was just another local that liked to play tricks on the out-of-staters. 
Another thump on the floor snapped him back to the present. This one so hard, he felt it in his feet. Clay turned and ran toward the stairs. He was determined to catch whoever it was, then give them more than just a piece of his mind. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream sounded out, freezing him in his tracks. After a moment, he continued down the stairs. He swept the light across the room, frantically searching for the mischief maker. The room was empty. Another scream pierced the still night air. It felt like it came from everywhere at once. Clay felt it in his bones. A third scream, this one from upstairs. No way, I was just up there. It was empty. He began walking toward the door, trying to think the situation through. Speakers. It had to be. Maybe wired batteries? He looked down into the camera once more. Screams were a nice touch. Had me freaked out for a second. Still not biting, though. He exited the building and continued to venture further around the side of the main prison complex. Behind the prison, acres of fields sat open. They were wildly overgrown after years of no attendance. This must be the farmland. Off to the right, he noticed a stone structure. He slowly made his way toward it, trudging through the almost waist-high grasses. The moon was now high in the sky, casting its wane light through the open area. As the structure grew near, it began to take shape. The structure was no structure at all. It was a stone wall that stood about chest high. A gap of almost three feet was toward the front, with an arching sign that read, Potter's Field, in rusted steel lettering. Using his light, Clay walked amongst the headstones, which were crumbling and weather-beaten. Most of the names and dates were ineligible, worn away by decades of wind and rain. Some of them had fallen over, a product of the constant rain and shifting earth. His mind began to conjure up images of zombies rising from the soft earth beneath his feet. <laughs> and all at once, Clay decided that he didn't want to be in the cemetery. He turned and quickly walked toward the entrance. He felt something brush against his skin, something cold, almost icy. Goosebumps jumped to his skin immediately. He turned the light toward the direction, but saw nothing. The night had grown cold, that was all. He noticed that he could now see his breath on the air as he exhaled. Suddenly, there was another scream, so loud that it hurt his ears. Clay knew that it had come from beside him, although he was alone. He felt the icy feeling on his skin, followed by a slight pressure in his mind's eye. He visualized the grip of icy fingers around his arms. Dead fingers. He screamed. No longer able to control himself, he ran. He headed around the prison complex, sprinting as fast as he could. He panicked, mind barely registering the heat rise as he fled the cemetery. He knew that he'd walked straight into the prison from his car, so if he ran straight out, he'd be back where he started. Leaves crunched beneath his feet as he ran. Small branches and briars tore at his face and arms. His legs ached and his lungs burned. His body cried out for relief for just a moment's rest. Yet, he continued to run. He dug within himself, trying to call up every ounce of reserve strength that he could muster. All around him, he heard the crunching of leaves as if some unknown assailant was in pursuit. This caused further panic in his mind, driving him forward. At several points during the exercise in panic and self-preservation, Clay could feel the icy pressure on his neck and back. Catching his foot on a tree root, Clay collapsed to the ground. The camera and flashlight flew from his hands. The flashlight spun in the air, casting ominous shadows all around him. Exhausted, he lay there, trying to catch his breath. His palms burned from the skin that had torn away from them. He slowly picked himself up off the ground. I have to be close to the road by now. As he looked up, 
His eyes widened in horror. Before him stood the prison complex. He knew that it should have been far behind him. A small squeak escaped from his throat. It was all he could manage in his terror. He bent and picked up the flashlight and camcorder, which was now smashed. He dropped it to the ground and turned, prepared to head toward his vehicle once more. Another scream. This one from right behind him. Without thinking, he turned and ran inside of the prison. He doubted that running into the woods again would have accomplished anything anyway. He was trapped here. He burst through the door, causing wind to stir up thick layers of dust that had settled over the years. He looked around frantically. The brick walls were covered in graffiti. Paint, long since peeled away, plaster lay on the ground, collapsed from the roof and walls. Spiderwebs hung from every opening, filled every corner. He leaned against the door, desperately trying to catch his breath. And then the door suddenly began shaking uncontrollably behind him. The hinges rattled. The wood creaked and splintered. Clay ran down the hall, silently praying for it to end. He ran to the stairs and stopped. The image of a person, translucent in the pale moonlight that shone through the barred windows, stood at the top looking down on him. He blinked and it was gone. It was enough to dissuade him from taking the stairs, though. He continued through the prison, his panic causing him to turn randomly. He finally stopped. Looking around, he became acutely aware that he was now lost within the confines of the prison. Metal began to creak and moan as the cell doors began to close, slamming shut loudly. Too scared to move, Clay waited until the activity had ceased. All was quiet within the prison once more. All except the swell of air. A breeze, a very light breeze, blew through the hallways and then returned. Clay got the distinct impression that the building was breathing. He tried to push this ridiculous thought from his mind, but it latched on and would not surrender its hold. He walked down the halls, trying to remain calm and reasonable. Panicking would not help this situation in any way. He needed a clear head. The feeling of being watched returned in full force. Or maybe it had never left him, and he was merely recognizing it for what it was once more. He could feel his muscles twitching and convulsing involuntarily from the fear that coursed through his veins. Sweat dripped from his pores, soaking his shirt and causing the dust to stick to his face. The salt stung the cuts and lacerations on his face and arms. He had to get his breathing under control. He was on the verge of hyperventilating. He placed his hand on the wall and leaned against it in an attempt to control himself. He jerked it away suddenly, pure horror washing over him at what he felt. It had to have been his imagination. It had to. Clay tentatively placed his hand back on the wall to reassure himself. He yanked it away quickly, wiping his hands on his pants as if he had stuck it in something. The thought of what he had touched was revolting. It was definitely not his imagination. The wall was pulsing. It seemed to expand and contract in time with the breeze, almost like lungs. The movement was slight, only really noticeable if he touched the wall, but it was there just the same. The hall was suddenly cold. It chilled the beads of sweat on his brow and caused him to shiver uncontrollably. As he exhaled, he could see his breath in puffs of gray smoke. Another scream echoed through the halls. He swung his flashlight around, searching for the source. 
and to his dismay he found it. Standing at the end of the hall was a prisoner. The top of his head was badly burned, the skin charred and flaking. Small patches of dried gore sat below each eye socket, which was empty. He clawed frantically at his face with shackled hands. His movements were jerky and disconnected, almost like watching a film with frames missing in the reel. He continued to claw furiously at his face. Then he screamed once more. The metal bars rattled and dirt shook free from the ceiling in small clouds. As he screamed, he began to walk toward clay. Small steps inhibited by the shackles around his ankles. His body twitched and shook with each step in that same disconnected, strobe light-esque fashion. Clay ran down the hallway, frantic once more. He ran through cold spots that chilled into the core and back into the sticky Louisiana humidity. He searched for an exit, any possible way to escape the terror that he had been subjected to. He passed a multitude of barred windows, wishing that he could use one broken glass crunched underfoot as he ran. There was no exit to be found. He continued down another hallway, stopping at something written on the wall. His eyes widened and his jaw dropped at the sight of the words. We've been expecting you. The wall suddenly cracked open, splitting from the roof to the floor like a giant jagged mouth. The crack split the floor open, just as Clay began running once more. As he ran, the sounds of splintering wood, collapsing plaster, and shattering concrete followed him. Too terrified to look back, he kept running. No longer able to breathe, legs weak and wobbly, Clay collapsed as the crack opened up beneath his feet. His head slammed into the ground, sending a bright light across his vision. Just before he lost consciousness, he saw... He saw legs bound in shackles. Clay woke up momentarily as he was drugged down the concrete stairs to the basement. He felt his head slam into each step as he descended. Stars flashed before his eyes with each successive blow. The darkness closed over him once more. He groggily opened his eyes. He felt as though his head were going to explode. His face was on fire from where he had connected with the floor. He felt the warmth of his blood running down the nape of his neck from the repetitive strikes against the concrete stairway. He tried to raise his hand to check his wound and found that he could not. The instant fear cleared the remaining cloudiness from his mind. Looking down, Clay noticed that both of his hands were strapped down. He tried to move his legs, only to find that they too were strapped down. He attempted to look around, but something prevented it. He cast his eyes upwards. He was just barely able to see the metal headband that circled his forehead. Suddenly, he heard a whirring sound. It was the sound of a small lever being wound. For the past couple of weeks now, I've been noticing a few odd things in my apartment. It started off with food mysteriously disappearing from my refrigerator and pantry while I'd be away at work. I didn't think much of it at the time, since every now and then I'd lose track of my daily eating habits due to my busy schedule, so I simply brushed it off. Unfortunately, it didn't stop there. Almost every night, I could have sworn I could hear shuffling sounds coming from within the walls, and sometimes when I got home late from work, I'd find both my computer and my TV turned on, even when I distinctly remembered turning them off before I left. Strangely, the TV would always be turned on to the local news, and my computer search history would show several results for nearby takeout restaurants. <laughs> Needless to say, it was freaking me out a bit. The building I lived in had tight security, with officers frequently patrolling the area, and it was located in the part of the city where crime was pretty scarce. Considering that I'd given a couple of my friends copies of my apartment key to make sure that I wouldn't misplace them, which I often did, I thought perhaps that one of them was trying to mess with me. 
I was eager to get to the bottom of this, so I asked if either of them were the culprit. But they both vehemently denied it. And this, of course, put me on edge. So I asked my landlord to check the security footage on my floor for any suspicious activity. To his credit, he immediately began searching through two weeks of recorded footage, looking for any unfamiliar faces entering my apartment. He finished his investigation the following week and said that he'd found nothing out of the ordinary. Something to worry about, he assured me. Probably all in your head, man. At the time, I was considering the possibility that maybe he was right. Being a domestic abuse lawyer, I've had to deal with a lot of stressful cases and work overwhelmingly long hours. Perhaps the numerous caffeine-fueled nights and constant headaches were starting to get to me. On one particular snowy day, I was coming down with a nasty cold and had to call in sick for the next few days. Despite having to reluctantly waste some of my days off on such a gloomy occasion, I was still glad to be temporarily free from my hectic obligations. It was around 7.30 and I was getting pretty tired. I finally made it near my apartment on the 6th floor. I just got back from picking up some remedies at Walmart and was anticipating a nice long night of peace and relaxation. Just as I stood in front of the door, I immediately heard a faint shuffling in the distance. My eyes scanned the hallway for any signs of life. Nothing. Suddenly I could hear footsteps quickly creaking on a wooden surface. After listening closely, I made a chilling realization of where those footsteps were coming from. Inside my apartment. This couldn't have been one of my friends, as I'd recently changed the lock on my door due to all the strange things that had been happening. A sudden chill went up my spine because I knew right then and there that an intruder had somehow broken in. At that moment, I felt really uneasy. I wanted to run downstairs, call for help, but I knew if I left the hallway at this point, the intruder would definitely make a break for it. Being the naive young man that I was, I was determined to go inside, grab my gun, and try to apprehend whoever was inside. Taking in a deep breath, I slowly unlocked the door and creaked it halfway open. I was instantly hit with a powerful, ghastly odor that made me want to puke. It smelled like something had been decaying in there for quite some time. Ignoring it, I cautiously proceeded to the kitchen to grab the gun I kept hidden in the top drawer. I grabbed it and turned on the lights. To my surprise, the first thing I noticed were several pizza boxes and takeout bags scattered across the ceramic tiles. It struck me as rather odd because I knew I didn't order any takeout that day. I also noticed that there were food-covered footprints leading directly into the living room. Someone was definitely in here, and it looked like they were in a hurry to remain hidden from me. I slowly made my way into the living room with my gun at the ready. The footprints led right next to the boarded up wall that was stationed on the other side of the room. There were a couple of half broken planks in the middle of it that I hadn't gotten around to fixing yet. Very carefully, I walked toward the wall for a closer inspection. My heart was beating with every inch I took. I stopped walking around a few feet away from it and began closely examining it. I couldn't make out anything inside, so I moved my head in even closer to search for any signs of life. Again, nothing was completely visible, so I pulled out my phone, put it to the wall, and turned the light on. Suddenly, out of nowhere, I saw two amber-red eyes staring directly at me. My heart dropped like a rock. I quickly stumbled backwards, trying to keep my balance. A sudden rush of adrenaline swiftly filled my entire body. I quickly spoke in the most intimidating voice I could muster. If you don't get the fuck out from there right now, I swear I'll blow your fucking brains out, I exclaimed. Silence subsequently followed. 
I was half expecting some demented lunatic to rush out from there and attack me out of nowhere, so I prepared myself for an epic battle. Can you fucking hear me? I'm not messing around. Before I could finish my sentence, I was interrupted by a faint sobbing coming from within the wall. The intruder took a deep breath and spoke in a soft tone. Please don't hurt me. I'm really sorry about what I've done, the intruder replied. The voice sounded like it belonged to a frightened little girl around the age of 13. This really wasn't the dramatic response I was expecting. I lowered my gun as the tension in the room quickly shifted to that of confusion. Oh, Jesus, kid, you nearly scared me half to death. What? Who are you, and what exactly are you doing in there? No response. It seemed like my initial reaction shook her up a bit. It's okay, you can tell me. I promise I won't hurt you. I slowly backed away from the wall to assure her that I wasn't a threat. See? After a brief moment of silence, she replied once more. My name's Maple, she said in a jittery voice. I didn't mean to cause trouble, I only wanted to get away from my mean parents. Maple? I paused for a minute, trying to recollect where I've heard that name before. Then it hit me. Maple was the little girl that went missing in the area several weeks ago. The media reported that she allegedly ran away from home after her parents had physically abused her last Christmas. She must have slipped into my apartment when I forgot to lock the door that day. At that moment, I felt genuinely sympathetic, mostly because I've dealt with quite a few runaways in my line of work. Poor thing must have been scared to death. I guess when I ran out of food, she decided to break into my neighbor's apartment and help herself to leftovers. She probably dropped it all on the floor and made a break for it when she heard me come up to the door. I remembered at this point there was a police car parked right outside the building. I figured that I should first try to comfort her before calling the cops over. It's okay, sweetie. Everything's going to be all right, I assured her. Just please come out so I can make sure you're okay. She suddenly stopped sobbing and became quiet. Dead silence filled the room as I anxiously awaited her response. She was almost starting to freak me out. After about a minute passed, she finally said something. Okay, because you first put that gun on the floor and come closer. I need help getting out. Her voice sounded slightly deeper this time. The sudden shift in tension kind of threw me off at first. I wanted to comply with her demands, but I had this strange, eerie feeling deep inside that something was off. At the time, I couldn't make out what it was, though. Giving into my paranoia, I thought it was best if I just left her there while I went to go get help. Oh, um... Actually, just wait here, Maple. I'll be back soon with the... Wait, don't go! She interrupted in a surprisingly loud and desperate plea. The sudden outburst made my whole body flinch. You can't leave me here. My ankle, it hurts really bad. I think I twisted it when I slipped on the floor. I don't think I can get out on my own. You have to get me out of here right now. This place is really creeping me out. I hesitated for a moment. Believe me, I wanted nothing more than to help her out, but there was something about her tone that made me feel like she wasn't completely telling the truth. My intuitions usually pretty good at judging whether or not someone was lying, so I was inclined to follow my gut feeling. I'll only be a couple of minutes. Hang in there, kiddo. I promise I won't be long. I quickly ran out of my apartments before she could say another word. After a brief elevator ride down, I spread across the hall, out the spinning doors, and into the freezing weather. To my relief, I found a slightly chubby officer talking to a slim partner right across the street from me. I ran toward them, eager to tell them everything that went down. Before I could make it halfway there, however, I froze. I remembered something 
that will forever send a chill down my spine. Can't believe I didn't realize this until now. That couldn't have been the same missing girl. Because last night she was found murdered a couple of blocks away, her lifeless body discovered stuffed inside the wall of a vacant apartment. It was all over the news this morning. Struck in awe, I was left nervously wondering who the hell was hiding in my walls this entire time. I wasted no time, and I rushed to the police and frantically told them everything like a nervous wreck. At first, they thought it sounded a bit sketchy, but after I persisted for a few minutes, they were finally persuaded to follow me and take a look. Without catching my breath, I ran back to my apartment with the officers following closely behind. When we made it to my living room, I showed them where the intruder was hiding. The chubby officer told me to step back as they both drew out their guns and pointed them at the wall. This is the police. I want you to get out here right now and put your hands on the ground. The officer's demands were met with silence. You have five seconds to comply or I'm dragging you out. Still nothing. This limb officer nodded, cueing his partner to go in. His partner pulled out a flashlight and slowly walked toward the wall with his gun still drawn. I anxiously watched as he made his way to the wall to put his head inside. He began thoroughly searching both sides. Did you find anything? No, it's all clear replied but I can tell someone's been hiding in here before he could finish the sentence he paused he put his head in deeper for a closer inspection hold up I think I see something judging by the surprise in his voice I had a feeling that he was about to discover something really disturbing I could feel it in my bones what is it his partner called out the chubby officer took his head out of the wall and looked at his partner with a shocked expression I think, I think I can see a couple bodies inside. Those words made my entire world turn upside down. I almost couldn't believe what I was hearing. Uh, are, are you sure about that? The slim officer asked. Yeah, I'm sure of it, he exclaimed. My God, I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. These bodies, they look so... Mutilated? Just, what the hell happened here? The unsettling thought that I just stood two feet away from human corpses made my stomach churn. The powerful stench of decaying flesh made me want to puke my guts out. I knew right then and there that whoever had been hiding in my walls this time was definitely not a little girl. Help me break down this wall. One of them could still be alive. The slim officer put his gun back into his holster and walked toward the wall. I watched from about 15 feet away as they both started breaking down the old planks one by one. They quickly teared off three rows of them with ease while blood started pouring out excessive amounts. Suddenly, out of nowhere, several lifeless, dismembered bodies fell right off the wall and onto the floor. My eyes grew wide with shock. Most of their flesh looked like it was violently bitten off and their mutilated faces were completely unrecognizable. The disturbing thought of the immense pain these victims must have suffered, though, was simply too much to take in. Upon taking a closer look at the type of clothes they had on, I made a chilling realization of who they were. They were all food delivery drivers from several nearby restaurants. I could barely make out the restaurant logos on their violently shredded and blood-soaked shirts. I wanted to look away from the gruesome sight, but there was something above the bodies that caught my eye. It looked like there was something written in blood on the inside of the wall. At first I couldn't make out what it said through the darkness of the room, so I slowly walked closer to read it more clearly. My body shook to its core the instant I realized what it said. You're lucky you didn't do what I asked. Focus on your breathing, silence your mind, drink warm milk, stay away from electronics, keep the room dark, take pills. All the ways the internet has told me to fall asleep. 
and they're all bullshit. For most everyone else, sleep is simple, really. You just lie down and suddenly eight hours have passed. Those people don't need to worry about what happens if they can't fall asleep. Not like me. Our entire existence boils down to the constant string of thought waving its way through our heads and our thoughts are what we are. But when you're left alone with those thoughts, for hours and hours, cut off from all external stimuli, that ever-present tiny little voice becomes something like torture. Very much like torture, in fact. I likened it to Chinese water torture, the practice of tying someone up and having a drop of water fall on their head at fixed intervals. Drip, drip, drip. It becomes a certainty. All that they can really focus on is the next drop of water. That's what it was like when I would try to sleep. One thought, and then another, and another, and another. Never letting my mind rest. It had been like that for as long as I could remember. Even as a little child, I would lie awake in bed, silently conversing with my stuffed animals. As I grew older, however, my insomnia became more of an issue. It held much more weight in my life than my old conversations with Mr. Teddy Bear. Of course, there were the obvious side effects. I lived like a zombie, only half in touch with the world. My mind, in its ceaseless need to think, jumped around, never able to focus on one thought. I was honestly fine with that part. The part I was not fine with were the things that stood in the corner of my bedroom when I couldn't sleep. People who sleep normally sometimes experience nightmares. Their own sleeping minds work against them to create terrifying situations. Monsters, spiders, murderers, there are no limits. The thing is, though, that those people wake up and their nightmares are gone. But my nightmares were real, physical things. And they were different every time. I've had the typical fears. Giant spiders, clowns, chainsaw murderers and such. But every now and then, I got creatures. Horrid abominations that were particularly unpleasant. They had ways beyond my understanding of keeping my room dark, of preventing lights from working so I never got to make out more of their images than the moonlight would allow. The occurrences, my own twisted version of nightmares, have been happening ever since I moved into my own apartment. Nightmares are generally a result of stress, so my theory is that the stress of moving out on my own caused these nightmares. But somewhere along the line, something went wrong. My nightmares were not confined to my head. I didn't know why. I just knew that they were very real. The memory of the first time it ever happened is permanently engraved into my mind. How could I forget? It was the first week in my new apartment. I hadn't even unpacked, and I was swamped with work for my new desk job. Accounting. All of the stress had led to another of the all-so-familiar sleepless nights, but it was distinctly different. Rather than tossing and turning, I found myself to be lying quite still under my thin covers, unable to focus on anything other than my newfound headache. Headache's probably not the best way to put it. Hammering migraine is a better term. Pulsating waves of pain radiated from my skull. Even the soft touch of my pillow was enough to set my teeth on edge. I let out a groan of agony, and that seemed to be the start of it all. A crackling chuckle, similar to that of a smoker, raspy and dry, came out of the darkness in my room, responding to my pain. And just like that, my headache was gone, but it was replaced with a skin-chilling fear that led me to sit bolt upright. The chuckle continued. It came from the far corner, and then I very much knew that I was not alone in my own bedroom. It had been a cloudy night, so all I could do was squint into the darkness. Eventually, my eyes managed to make out the dark outline. It was a person. Sort of. 
I could make out two struts of curly hair shooting out of the side of a bald head, all topped with a very tiny top hat. I didn't need to turn on my bedside lamp, which I was far too afraid to do regardless, to know that it was a clown. There had been a clown standing in the corner of my room, chuckling continuously. Hours went by as I watched him, but he never moved, and he never stopped that damn laugh. I hadn't slept much around that time, perhaps as little as four hours of sleep in the previous 48 hours, and that lack of sleep was what nearly got me killed. My thoughts were numb and out of focus, which is why at some point I managed to write off the clown silhouette in the corner as a fatigue-induced hallucination. With that conclusion easing my mind, it had been easy to eventually slip off and sleep. But that sleep was short-lived. I was forced to wake by a pair of gloved hands around my throat, and all I could manage to do was flail my arms around, doing absolutely nothing to remove the weight from my windpipe. My entire body burned, desperate for air, and I felt that I was not going to see the morning. Until a dim light briefly illuminated my window. It was a lone car, a solitary set of headlights driving past in the night. It saved my life. For the briefest of seconds, I could see the face of my assailant, all the paint of a clown with none of the charm. The entirety of his flesh was white as a sheet, completely contrasting the horrid splash of red around his mouth, blood, or paint. It was still disgusting. But the eyes were the worst part. The cold pupils were almost impossible to make out under the murky layer of darkness covering the surface, but I could tell they were still looking directly at me as he crushed my throat. But the moment I saw him in the flash of headlights, his grip released. All I could do was stare and try to suck in narrow breaths as the clown climbed off my bed and backed into his corner. Shakily, I sat up, never looking away from the clown, and I reached over to flick on my bedside lamp. The room remained dark. I hit the switch again and again, but the room remained dark. The clown once more began to chuckle. There was no way in hell that I could bring myself to move, to run, to call the police. All I did was sit and stare. And I could feel the clown stare back. It wasn't until the sun shone through my window that the clown disappeared. I just blinked and he was gone. I didn't want to acknowledge it as real. I just wanted to dismiss it for what it was. A nightmare. But the bruises on my neck would not allow me to do such a thing. Yet if I went to a doctor, I'd certainly be labeled insane. Not to mention that if I called in sick so early in my career, I'd lose my job. So I went into work, made up some tale of getting jumped by a vagrant to explain the bruises, and tried to get on with my life. Which was very difficult, considering I was met by a different creature the following night, a large spider, and the night after that, a machete murderer, and so on, which is what led me to begin drinking. My first visit to the local bar was two weeks after the first uh, visitor. The only sleep I'd had in that time period were the few minutes at a time I was able to get away with at work and 40 minutes during lunch. Of course, at first, I didn't take it lying down. No technology would work when they were present, and they only appeared during night hours, but I never had time to sleep during the day. I thought of everything a sensible person would think of. I thought about moving, about sleeping in other places, but a visit to a hotel yielded negative results. Getting an exorcism, and even briefly, I thought about ending my life. Those weeks were hell and I was quickly losing my motivation to push on. But on my first night of trying to drink the trouble away, almost as soon as I entered the bar, I became a cliché. I fell in love. The bartender, a soft-spoken, lanky brunette, Kathleen, was the most attractive woman I'd ever seen, so of course I made a fool of myself trying to talk with her. I was sleep-deprived and drunk, yet for some reason she took an immediate liking to me. 
She was quick to laugh at my poor jokes and didn't seem off-put at all by the excessive complaining I did about my job. Even drunk, I managed to avoid bringing up my nighttime companions. Although by the end of the first night with her, I felt as if I could trust her with that knowledge. But I held off. It's probably a good thing I did, too, seeing as how she asked for my phone number before I left the bar. That night was the first time I'd been happy in weeks. I'd almost let myself believe all of my problems had gone away. A pretty girl and a stomach full of beer was all it took for me to let my guard down. And I paid for it. That night, I climbed into my bedside chair with no intention of sleep. I'd let my guard down, but I had in no way allowed myself to forget the creatures in the night. Even if I didn't mean to sleep, it became quite difficult to focus on staying awake when my mind wandered to thoughts of Kathleen. Minutes, maybe hours, passed as I replayed our conversation. I'm not a witty person when I'm sober, and I'm even less witty while drunk. The last thought I had before losing the battle with my eyelids was that she must have been twice as drunk as I to be laughing at my jokes. A searing pain in my legs woke me up screaming. The normal light of my window was blocked by a hazy figure, tall with jagged arms that bent in too many places, and the entirety of its skin withered with needle-like protrusions. I figured that part out because they were being used to shred the skin on my legs. Not ashamed to admit that I screamed bloody murder. It didn't deter the nightmare at all. It just leaned further over me and reached toward my face with a razored tendril. The movement was slow and mocking. It was drawing out the anticipated pain. I was so focused on that one tendril that it almost drowned out the pain of my legs. The creature slowly drew closer and it towered over me as it finally connected with my cheek. There was only a pinprick of pain. The moment the monster touched my face, my phone buzzed and lit up, and once I could see it, the entire horrifying figure, the nightmare receded to its spot in the corner. My floor was soaked with the blood seeping from my legs and probably urine as well, but all I could think to do was to grab at the phone. I didn't understand at the time. Normally, nothing electronic worked when the nightmares were watching me, yet the phone lit up when I hit the button. And the screen flashed, a text from Kathleen. Sorry to text you so late. I couldn't sleep. I know you're probably in bed, but I just couldn't wait to ask if you'd like to have dinner to sometime. I called her. I was completely incoherent, sobbing and raving. I told her about the monsters in my room, the cuts on my legs, and how she just saved my life. All at two in the morning, the night after I met her, but she didn't hang up. She listened. And, bless her perfect heart, she asked, Where do you live? I'll come over. I told her to let herself in, and when she arrived, I don't think she expected me to actually have torn up legs. There was a lot of freaking out, rushing around. I imagine I lost a lot of blood, which is why it all seemed so hazy, but I know that Kathleen forced me to go to the hospital. Or, rather, she called an ambulance while consulting me, but I'm glad she did. I woke up in the hospital to her smiling face. I was so confused. Where am I? The hospital. You've been asleep for two days. Asleep? The word sounded so strange coming out of my mouth. Sleep was something for normal people, a fairy tale beyond my grasp. Sleep was something that came in 15-minute flashes here and there, never in hours. <laughs> yes, asleep. They're still trying to figure out what happened to you. They think some psycho broke into your apartment, but I'm glad you're okay. I've been here with you the whole time. Why? Far from the best choice of words to show gratitude. Why are you being so nice to me? Kathleen gave a tight grin in response. You just seem so lost. 
when I first saw you, it was like you were calling out for help. I don't really understand it either, but I already feel so connected to you. Oh, was all I replied, but in my defense, I was still groggy. Thank you so much. We were quiet for a while until she softly asked, Hey, when you called me, you said I saved your life. What do you mean? The memory of the creature flashed through my mind, and I must have grimaced. She glanced down at my cuts. You weren't planning on killing... on suicide, were you? Did you do that to yourself? No, no, it's... It's worse than that, I responded. It's just... I have... Nightmares. For some reason she didn't question that. Well, you're in no condition to be on your own. How about I spend the night with you and try to get rid of those bad dreams? She offered, and then seemed to understand what she had just said. I mean, just be there. Nothing sexual. No, no, no. I cut her off. The thought of how she might react to the monsters or how they might react to her. I wouldn't have it. You've done so much, and I still don't understand why, to be completely honest, but I don't want you to get hurt by this. She placed her hand on my cheek, opposite to where the nightmare had prodded me. I'm doing so much for you because your eyes are the saddest I've ever seen. Whatever it is you're facing, it's time to stop trying on your own. I'm coming to your place once you get out of here. There was no arguing beyond that. The cuts on my legs were many, but not deep, so I was actually able to walk out of there on my own feet, with Kathleen refusing to let go of my arm. We made it back to my apartment, and I insisted upon cooking for her, and we simply sat at the little kitchen table and talked. We made small talk about everything and anything yet. There wasn't a single subject that we had opposing views. She was the perfect girl, which is why it was so difficult for me to ask her to leave. Our conversation had been effortless and warm, but I shattered the mood. I... I need you to leave now. It's getting late and you shouldn't be here overnight. She ignored the request. Ah, time for the meat of the matter. So what are these nightmares that would compel you to turn away a pretty lady offering to spend the night? I suppose I just didn't want her to leave, so I figured screw it and I tried telling the truth. They're not really nightmares. They're monsters. I know I sound crazy, and I probably am, but for the last few weeks I haven't been sleeping. There have been these things in my room at night, watching me, waiting for me to stop watching them. If I look away, they... They come for me. I was almost strangled, and now my legs... You're not lying, are you? Her question wasn't patronizing in the slightest. She genuinely believed me which led me to believe that perhaps I wasn't the crazy one, but I no longer had the strength or desire to refuse her, as she said. Let's go to your bed. We'll face them together. A few minutes later, and we were doing something that few adults had ever done before, sitting in bed with a stranger they just met at a bar, yet doing absolutely nothing other than going to sleep. I made sure to leave every light in the room on, and Kathleen didn't seem to mind. Not like it mattered, though. As soon as we both settled down under the covers, the lights flickered off on their own. Her breath caught at the same time as mine. The two of us slowly sat back upright in the dark room, and I had the unshakable feeling that I should not have allowed Kathleen to stay. My voice was a hoarse whisper. They control the lights. They don't let me see them. She remained silent, and I followed suit as it became clear that we were not the only ones in the room. 
an all-too-familiar rasping arose from the far corner. My first waking nightmare. The clown. She could see it, too. Kathleen's voice was faint, even though she sat so close. When did this start? When I moved in here and got a new job, I replied dimly. My blood ran cold as the clown let out its humorless chuckle and my mind ran rampant with newly formed fears. It was the one thing for me to face the monsters. At least they ignored me when I focused on them. But what if the clown attacked Kathleen? There are more, she pointed out. I kept my eyes plastered on the darkness of the room. A dim moonlight leaking through the shades illuminated that awful fact. Kathleen was correct. More creatures lined the walls of the room, surrounding the bed, all staring at the two human occupants. What actually happened to your Lex? She asked faintly. I was too absorbed in our surroundings to realize the oddity of the question. I fell asleep. One of them got to me. And with a sinking realization, I saw the very same buzzing outline of the needle creature that had torn apart my flesh. But Kathleen continued to press on. And what stopped it? You. You messaging me. And you said one of them tried to strangle you. What stopped that one? Someone's headlights. I responded numbly as my eyes further adjusted to the darkness and revealed the four-foot tarantula clinging to one of the walls. More of the creatures appeared with every second, and all I could think about was the horrible things that they would do to Kathleen if I didn't keep my eyes on them. Then one of them took a step forward. I whipped my head toward it, the machete murderer. But when I faced it, one of the other creatures drew closer. I couldn't watch all of them. Somehow Kathleen managed to keep talking. They started when you had a big change in your life, and human interaction made them go away. We need to make a run for it, I replied, only half listening to her as the mob of nightmare closed in on the bed. There's never been more than one. I looked to my right, and the spider was no longer on the wall, but on the ceiling overhead, and when I looked back down, the needle monster was almost within arm's reach. No matter which way I turned, they managed to draw in closer. All I could manage to do was whimper. You go. Maybe they just want me. She cut me off with a kiss. Her entire body weight flung against mine as she pinned me against the pillows. My mind was in a panic. I couldn't see a single nightmare, so I figured they must be about to pounce. But still, she pressed against me, and I guess I also kissed back. Might as well enjoy our last moments, but... Nothing happened. She broke away, and we both drew in breath. Then I gasped as I saw the empty bedroom around us. The lights flickered on as she rolled back to her side of the bed. How? You told me yourself, she replied with a relieved giggle. Interaction makes them go away, be it a stranger driving by or someone texting you in the middle of the night. Or maybe the most intense kiss of my life. They're gone. That's all I could think. And then, how are you so amazing? I'm not. I'm really not. I get lonely, I do stupid things, like call crazy drunks I just met and work in a bar to make a living. I'm anything but perfect. The monsters were gone, and I got the impression they weren't coming back, not as long as Kathleen was with me. Now it was my turn to kiss her, and when it was all over, I said, Well, you're perfect to me. She just grinned and curled up under the covers, somehow ready to go to sleep. Come on. We need some sleep. And for the first time in weeks, I was able to let my head sink into my pillow without worry. The end to a horrid chapter in my life, all thanks to the amazing bartender at my side. She was my hero. And I had to find a way to put it into words. I needed to express my true gratitude, and it took a while, but I got it. I wrapped my arm around her and said, You're my dream come true.
We called them fallen angels. They were strung up by their ankles and suspended from trees. There was always barbed wire wrapped all around the body. Sliced the skin, ripped the tissue, but it was worse if they struggled. Ideally, they would die of dehydration. But this mercy was extended to only a very fortunate few. Most of the time, they would dangle from the branches for hours as the barbs tore their flesh and the pressure built in their heads. When upright, the heart doesn't have to pump that blood that hard to circulate through the brain. Gravity does most of the work to get it back down. Consequently, the blood vessels up there are smaller and thinner than in the rest of the body. I'd rather be hung, personally. I'd much prefer the struggling for breath and kicking the air and the white-hot agony of my vertebrae coming apart than waiting for the blood to pull in my head, clot, and eventually burst the veins and feel the warm, sticky liquid drip out of my eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. A noose would be kinder, and suffocation gentler. There's something in there, my brother would tell me from the porch, pointing his cigarette toward the trees. He watches people, strings up the one it don't like. As paranoid as he was, I agreed with him. He spent a lot of time on that porch. I don't let him smoke in the house. He sat out there, cigarette in one hand, gun in the other, just watching the woods and waiting for something to come out. One night I heard him yelling, frantically trying to get my attention. Gunshot after gunshot exploded through the air and intermingled with his crazed screaming. I ran out onto the porch to find my brother in a panic that was slowly turning to rage. Guns don't do shit. I saw them. Their eyes were just peering out from the trees, fucking watching me. They almost glowed. He emphatically pointed to the woods behind our house, trying to show me the eyes that weren't there. There's no reason to wake up the whole neighborhood. My brother had this habit of keeping his cigarette between his teeth when he talked. It didn't matter how important what he said was. I could only see the glowing end of the cigarette bobbing up and down as the words fell out. Fucking infuriating, and it was one of those trivial things that finds its way under your skin and stays there, tapping at the inside of your skull. I expressed my displeasure several times, but he didn't seem to care much. I must have been giving him a look this time, because he yanked the cigarette out of his mouth and let it limply dangle in his fingers. I will not be strung up in those woods. He spit his final words at me before stomping out his remaining half-cigarette and storming inside. I wasn't worried that the neighbors would call the police. They knew my brother, and they knew the woods. It was amazing the things you'd get away with in this town. Everybody here was afraid, but more than that, they were constantly on edge, as if their whole body seethed with anticipation. The paranoia that was so ingrained into these people could only be born out of desperation. It seemed that they had tried everything. Guns, knives, brute force. Shit, one time someone tried to light the whole forest on fire. Kids played in the street, or preferably if they had friends from the next subdivision in the backyards in the next neighborhood over. When they grabbed their flashlights in the middle of the night, they would tell stories about the woods. They never talked about Bloody Mary or Slender Man, because in Fairdale, the real horror lived ten feet behind their homes. I don't think anyone in town that had seen the creatures in the woods, but we all knew what they looked like. The descriptions were spread in passing whispers and hushed voices out of fear that they were listening. All the children spoke softly but emphatically about their gray skin, six-inch fingers, and hollow, infinite sockets carved deep into their skull. They seemed almost human. And maybe they once were. Once that I can remember, a kid went to the forest. A bunch of others dared him, too. 
They waited in the shadows between the houses, hearts pounding, even though they weren't the ones going in. In silence, they watched him glance back, hoping they would call the whole thing off. And reluctantly, he submerged himself into the trees. There was the snapping of twigs, and then, abruptly, a stillness. The group did not take their eyes off the woods, yet they could see the fear among their friends. They waited for a minute, surprisingly, before cautiously taking a few steps backward, then turning and sprinting away. The boy was gone. The very next day, a group of police officers, most of whom resigned that same day, were sent in after him. Let me tell you, he struggled. The wire tore through the skin of his abdomen, leaving his internal organs to spill out and hang from his body. After that day, no children went into the woods. They didn't even have to be told not to. After the paper ran that story, Fairdale lost its mind. Sure, bodies turned up every other week, but it was never a child kind of death that was somehow more than a murder. It was a disaster, a tragedy. I lived right on the edge of those woods, and that incident stuck with me. It somehow made the whole thing real. These things were here, right behind my house. My last night in Fairdale was hopefully the worst of my life. My brother was outside smoking. I was on the couch, mostly asleep. I'm not a heavy sleeper, so I was glad when the small noises around me seemed to quiet down, but just as I was about to drift off, my mother fired at that goddamn gun about 3,000 times, ran inside, slammed the door behind him, his fucking cigarette still lit, clamped fiercely between his teeth. I shot up, dazed and unsure of what was happening. Hands trembling, my brother ran to all the doors and windows, making sure they were locked. What the fuck, man? I rubbed my eyes, wishing that I was sleeping. He sat on the coffee table inches from me, voice raspy and frightened. I saw them. They came out. His eyes were crazed. His mouth was running faster than his head. He inadvertently blew smoke from his lips with every rushed word and forced breath. I didn't even know you could see him. My mouth opened, but before I could speak, I heard something tapping on the sliding glass door. My jaw hung ajar, my brother and I froze instinctively. It was too soft to be a knock, but too hard to be the wind. A moment later, it came again. They're coming to get me, my brother whispered. His eyes were wild, darting across the room as if he were afraid to leave them in one place for too long. They don't like me. You're sure you saw them? My voice was barely audible. Somehow I knew that they could hear me anyway. I first noticed them in the corner of my eye, just one at first, but, but more came. Tall. My god, they were tall. Until they started moving, I thought they were trees. Their arms hang at their sides, and they're as gangly as branches. Who gave them away was the skin. It looked just like ash. Tap, tap, tap. While the sound did not increase in volume, they came to new places. I heard them still from the door but now they were also at the windows sides of the house and most disturbingly the roof they don't have faces I mean they've got eyes but not really they've just got these holes my brother made circles with his pointer finger and thumb and held them up over his own eyes and the holes have this have this black shit coming out of them down their heads. I think 
they could be human if they wanted to be. Tap, tap, tap. My palms were clammy, and I broke out in a cold sweat. I can picture their long, bony fingers wrapping on the house, their not eyes inches from the window waiting for us to draw back the curtain and meet their gaze. Until that moment, I didn't think I'd ever been truly afraid. Tap, tap, tap. It echoed all around us. We knew we couldn't leave, and even if we called someone, what good would it do? I didn't think that anything could save us. Our only option was to wait and hope that we had not received a death sentence. Tap, tap, tap. I now could hear it coming from beneath the house. These things were everywhere. It scared me that they just didn't burst in, that they were waiting for something, and it scared me more that I didn't know what. I couldn't do anything but wait. This isn't how I wanted to die. My brother and I sat on the floor between the couch and coffee table and hoped it would end. What do you think they are? I asked. We'd heard all the stories, but these creatures had no name. They simply existed. They were always here, and we did everything we could to leave them alone, to live without them. And for the most part, they let us. They took some people, I suppose, to make an example. It was a constant reminder of the fear, and maybe it kept this town in line. My brother's head was bowed, and his eyes would not meet mine. He lit his fourth cigarette taking a long drag and holding it deep in his lungs before releasing it. With his eyes still fixed at the floor, he said the only words that have ever struck real fear into my core. Jimmy, I... Jimmy, I think they're God. I could only hear the tapping and feel them staring into me from all directions. Despite the emptiness of the house... We knew that they were, in some way, both inside and outside. I forced my eyes shut, and in the darkness I was only able to picture their elongated limbs hanging at their sides, their shoulders hunched to fit under low ceilings. God, I could feel the inky ooze dripping onto my hair. I refused to open my eyes, because if I did, they might have been there. If they remained closed, it was easier to pretend. Tap, tap, tap. My brother promised me that he would stay awake all night. He swore. Grabbing a pillow from the couch, he handed it to me and insisted that I slept. I argued, but I was so tired. Eventually, I did fall asleep, albeit against my will. Tap, tap, tap. It had to be noon when I awoke. I was alone. I checked the whole house and even mustered up the nerve to step onto the porch, but I was alone. Dead or alive, I had to find my brother. I went into the woods. I think, I think that was the biggest fuck up of my entire life. After a deep breath, I stepped into the tree line. The sun was high in the afternoon sky, but it was impossibly dark inside that forest and even more unbelievably silent. I was the only thing that disturbed the stillness. I'll be honest here and say that I didn't have a plan. I had no idea where to look for my brother, and I didn't know how I would react if I found him in the branches. When I stopped in a small clearing to look around, the blurs at the corners of my vision began to move. I knew what it was. I froze, and I think that even my heart stopped beating. Maybe they wouldn't see me. Maybe they'd leave. Maybe I was losing my mind. They got closer to me, close enough to see. If they didn't move, they could be the trees, but if they did... They were something that shouldn't have been allowed to exist. I shut my eyes and ran blindly through the forest, running into trees and scraping my arms on low-hanging branches. Miraculously, I made it out. I didn't stop running until I threw myself in the car. 
I sped down the highway and checked into a motel, though it took me an extra hour to fall asleep that night. I kept the TV turned up just in case they came tapping. I never saw my brother or Fairdale ever again. I'm no genius, but I knew when to get the fuck out of that town. I moved to a new state, this time making sure I lived in the city, away from the woods. Even though years and miles have passed since that night, every so often I hear the tapping again. With the knowledge that I can never escape my hometown, I'm left with nothing else to do but wait. Until it's my turn, and just hope that I dehydrate. I don't know what to do at this point, which is why I've come here. What I've seen has changed me. I don't know if what I've seen is real, but I believe it to be, as I saw it with my own eyes, a horrific sight from the darkest of nightmares. I'll try to explain my situation as best I can, but I pray to God there is someone who reads this that has had a similar experience. If not, then I'll have to come to the conclusion that I'm insane, which would be difficult. My whole life has been a practical one, and up until this day, I've only known reality. I now have seen such things as of last night that completely contradict any of my past beliefs of this reality in which we all live. Please bear with me as I try to explain my situation as it is a strenuous task. Let me first introduce myself as I have yet to do so. I go by the name my lovely parents gave me, Nathan James Willem. I'm a man of 20-some-odd years, and I've been an attorney of law for the past four of them. I reside alone in my homely little house in the suburban area of my town. It's been my home for no more than two years at this point in time, and I was finally settled into the place when the strange occurrences began. It was no more than a month ago that I awoke to a sort of ripping or tearing sound outside the wall of my bedroom. The wall I speak of is the barrier that separates my bedroom from the outside part of my backyard, where I let my garbage bin sit when it's not trash day in my neighborhood. It took me only a few moments of thinking in my sleepy state to determine what the noise was. Something was going through my garbage. A critter, most likely. I figured I should probably go out with my flashlight to scare the thing off before it thrashed open the bags in the bins and scattered bits of rotten garbage all over my yard. I rose from my bed, teetered a bit in my not-yet-awake state, and then grabbed my black mag light I kept in the bedside drawer. I roamed the dark rooms of my home until I'd made my way to the back door. Once outside, I strolled over to the side of my house, guided by the light of my back porch light, and made my way toward the area that connects my front yard to the back with a locked wood gate. Once I was in the area with the bins, I switched on my mag light, expecting to catch the creature in the act a possum or raccoon, whatever it was, but there was nothing. Just my bins of garbage leaning against the wall with their tops flipped up. The bags inside were somewhat torn, but there was no garbage that I could see on the ground in front of me using the light. There was, however, a horribly disgusting smell. A smell that I cannot accurately describe. You may be thinking something like, Well, duh, there's a smell. You're standing next to the garbage, Nathan. Use your damn head. And yes, I was standing next to the open garbage bins, but this horrific smell wasn't that of the garbage in front of me. It was... It was from the thing. It smelled like death. Worse than a corpse, actually. Like I said, the smell is most indescribable, and it still lingers in that spot today. It's as if I can't get it out of my nostrils, even if I were to cut off my nose. The smell is so uncanny and unnatural. Those are the best terms I can use to describe it to others. That night, I returned to my bedroom and laid down again, feeling quite puzzled. 
I wondered why the animal had so neatly torn open the bags in my bins without knocking them over or scattering the contents everywhere. How did the creature disappear without a trace only moments after he heard the noises from my bedroom, leaving nothing but its horrid smell behind? It was quite eerie, though I let these thoughts go eventually as I drifted off to sleep again. I can't remember for sure, but I feel as if I had very strange dreams for the rest of that night. Though, again, I can't recall any of them at this point, so I can't say for certain. I slept peacefully for the next week or so with no disturbances in the nights following the incident. I remember rolling the trash bins to the street in the cool evening of the Tuesday that week, Wednesday, it's trash day in my neighborhood, and realizing that the rotten smell still refused to cease from lingering in the air on the side of the house where the bins usually sat. It was quite disturbing to me, and I even went to the point of asking my neighbor what the cause may be. Rachel is the name of the quiet lady who shares a fence with me that separates our yards on that particular side of my house. I don't know much about her, honestly. She's young, single mother, and usually keeps to herself. I caught her one morning that week walking from her front door to her gray SUV parked in her driveway. I did something then that I hadn't really cared to do since I moved into this house. I struck up a conversation with the woman. Out of desperate effort, I hurried through the small talk while trying my best to not seem rude and asked her about the smell. I was disappointed to find that even though Rachel keeps her garbage bins on the other side of the fence, she couldn't smell anything. I asked her if anything had been in there recently, and she told me that there hadn't been any reason for her to believe that there was. I even led her over to the wood gate that leads to my backyard and asked her if she knew what the horrible smell might be from. I remember her awkwardly tilting her head and looking at me briefly before saying, Smell? I don't smell anything unusual, and I'm pretty sure my sense of smell is still intact. As weird as it was, the woman truly didn't smell anything. I felt embarrassed in the moment. I apologized to Rachel for acting strange as I did and let her go on about her day. The embarrassment faded shortly after, and I remember doing a good bit of thinking that day. Why was the smell still there after a whole week? Why was I able to smell it even from the part of my front yard by the wood gate when Rachel smelled nothing? It was so strong when I was near the gate, yet the smell went unnoticed by Rachel when she was standing right next to me. Am I insane? I might be, but I'll get back into that in a bit. It was a few days after my conversation with Rachel that I was awoken by the familiar noise again. I remember briefly looking at my phone to check the time. 3.33 a.m. Once again, I rose from the warm cover and sheets of my bed and grabbed the mag light out of my drawer. It was then that the noise outside ceased, almost as if something large was in the bins and digging into the bags as the bins knocked against the wall. Something as small as a raccoon couldn't be making such a ruckus, so I figured a stray dog may have found its way into my yard through a hole in the fence or something. This time, along with my mag light from the drawer, I grabbed my baseball bat I kept under the bed. I didn't intend to hurt whatever it was, but figured it's better to be safe rather than sorry. I've always been taught to practice caution, a principle I live by and even apply to my daily work as an attorney. Anyway, with my bat and mag light, I made my way through the house and out the back door. This time, the noises hadn't ceased once I made it outside. I wasn't scared, but maybe a bit nervous. I made it all the way to the side of my house with the bins when the noise finally stopped right before I was able to switch my light on. The strange thing about the incident is that there was no trace of sound of the creature's abrupt escape. It's as if it just vanished at the perfect time, right before I would see it. I remember thinking to myself, what the fuck, before the smell hit me like a train. And the smell was stronger now. God, the smell. I can vividly recall almost losing my balance as it filled my nostrils in threatening waves. 
If I hadn't quickly placed my hand on the wall, then I think I probably would have fainted on the spot. I flashed my light around the seam, the beam of light darting from fence to the wall and then to the ground. When I came to the conclusion that the thing that had been there only a few moments ago had completely vanished, I slowly approached the bins. With the light of the flashlight set on the spot that the bins sat, I could see exactly what had happened. The bin that I used for my recyclable waste was left unfaltered, but the main waste bin was left with the lid open and leaning against the wall of my house. The smell was utterly unbearable. You would think that your nose would become accustomed to even the worst of scents if exposed to them long enough, but this smell is different. Different from anything I've ever smelled in the entirety of my life. It never faded a bit, but only grew stronger as I peered over the open waste bin and fixed my light into its contents. What I saw then made my spine go rigid. Upon the torn bag in the bin lay a single envelope with my name and address. A piece of my own mail, discarded by none other than myself only a few days before. I can still remember shuffling through the mail I'd received when I recognized the envelope that contained a copy of a bank statement. I remember tossing the unopened envelope into the trash can I keep in my kitchen as I have no need for a written statement. I do most of my banking online these days. It was I stood by the bins that night, staring at the envelope. Fear surged through me. I felt cold. I looked at the envelope that was now torn open at the top, either by a knife or someone's nails, and felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up straight. I picked up the envelope and realized its contents were now gone. It was then that I realized that this wasn't an animal that had been in my trash that night. It was a person... A human being had gone through the contents of my garbage to find a statement with my personal information and then vanished with it without any trace other than that terribly unnatural smell. I can well remember getting no more sleep that night as I went over the incident in my head for the rest of the dark hours before morning. Creepy thoughts filled my head and I couldn't seem to get rid of them for long, no matter how hard I tried. Who the hell could it have been? A past defendant seeking vengeance for a case I managed. Possible, but most likely not, judging by the smell. A homeless person, maybe? They tend to give off a certain stench from lack of a place to bathe. I thought to myself, even someone who hadn't showered since the day they were born would smell much better than the stench that refuses to leave the side of my house. I was stumped. I contemplated filing a report for a short time, but eventually dismissed the idea. I usually take matters into my own hands, and I didn't believe that my local law enforcement would be able to do much with the case evidence I currently possessed. There was nothing to go on. At least I thought there wasn't, until I went over to the scene the next morning and found the print. I was paralyzed unable to move at the unsightly print in the wet mud before the bin. There was only one, and was not of human form, from what I could tell. Coupled with the lingering stench, the footprint was a horror to behold, and I remember having to swallow vomit in my mouth as first gaze upon the mud. The print of what I thought was from a foot of some kind had not five, but two toes. The best way I can find to describe it myself is that of the shape of a pair of flippers used for scuba diving and such, though only one print was made instead of two, and the head of the flipper had a strange indent that formed two obvious toes. This is what made me realize that the print was not of a shoe or some other kind of footwear. It was the footprint of some deformed person's actual foot. It was not a pleasant sight to behold in your own backyard, and as I was finally able to move again, I pulled my phone out of the pocket and snapped a picture of the print to save for evidence in whatever case I may possibly have needed in the future. I can't say I slept well the next few nights, as I recall, though there were no noises or signs to indicate the person was back in my garbage. 
The same day I found the print, I took it upon myself to order a personal surveillance camera from Amazon just for under a hundred bucks that arrived the next evening via my Prime membership. I set the camera up outside on the corner of the roof of my house so that it would capture the entirety of that side where the bins were. The camera was able to capture a night vision wireless feed that I'd set up on my laptop that I kept on my bedside table. It was good quality, as I figured out from testing, but it could not capture sound. Well, this wasn't a big deal to me. I only wanted to see for myself who was going through my waste to acquire personal information so that I could have evidence to submit to the police, in hopes that they would be able to identify the intruder. For a week or so after, I'd set up the camera, and there were no disturbances. It wasn't until the night before last... That it happened. I awoke from a loud bang, the sound I knew at once to be the garbage bin hitting the wall of which my bed sits against. It was louder than the previous times, and it came with a ravaging noise. Whoever it was that was on that side of the house was furiously ravaging through the waste bin, caring not one bit about the sheer volume of noise it was producing in doing so. At first, I just laid there, unable to move out of pure fright. I was paralyzed for no more than two minutes as I sat there listening to the intruder on the outside. When I finally broke free of the paralysis, I quickly reached over to my bedside table, grabbed my laptop, and flipped it open. I pulled up the camera feed, and what I saw on the screen numbed my body from head to toe. Feelings of terror, panic, and absolute fear of the unknown were all I felt for a time as I looked at what was on the screen, as I became completely paralyzed once again. I saw the thing sitting in a crouched position upon the outer rim of the bin as if it held no weight. It was rummaging through the bin with inhuman maneuvers of its dark arms. It was somewhat humanoid in the nature of the form of its body, but it was no human by any means possible. It was made up of a dark, blackish mass of what looked kind of like shaggy fur, though I knew this wasn't the case. It was not fur that I saw which made up the mass of this thing. It was some sort of black fire, ghastly in nature, that would flare like that of the flames of a fire. Its hands were not hands, and said they were a pair of claw-like spikes that darted out from each of the thing's forearms. The feet were almost impossible to make out by the angle of the camera, and the position of the thing was crouched, though I had no doubt then and there it was the same thing that had made the unearthly footprint I'd seen in the mud only last week. The thing then rotated its dark head so slowly and so unnaturally to face directly up and toward the camera. It was then that I saw the creature's face that I screamed like a child, or so I thought I did. No noise came out of my terrified self as I recall correctly. Upon its face, the creature had dimly lit red eyes as if the light in which was keeping the glowing color alight was some sort of supernatural explanation unknown to humans. From what I could see, the sort of demon had no mouth or nose, just those evil red eyes that flickered and flared like the rest of its body. It looked directly into the camera for a time that seemed like a year in the moment almost as if it knew I was looking directly back into its eyes through the camera. Did this creature know I was only a few feet from itself, where I then laid in my bed, separated only by the thin wall of my house? Just as the thought crossed my mind, the thing on the screen vanished before my eyes, and the camera feed went dead only seconds after, nothing but a screen of static. For the rest of the night, I did not dare to move nor try to sleep. There were no signs that the thing was still out there at any other time of night, but I was too terrified to get out of bed. I just lay there with the covers covering all my body except for my head for what seemed like eternity. It wasn't until daylight streamed through my bedroom and I could hear the sounds of the suburban life outside commencing that I finally arose. First thing I did was check the scene of the incident. 
puked at the stench when I got close to the side of the house, but not much came up as I hadn't eaten anything in a good twelve hours. I pressed on toward the bends and saw that once again only the main waste had been tampered with, and I couldn't tell if the creature had taken anything with it this time. What I did find gone, however, was the camera. It was as if it had vanished along with the creature. What's worse is the recording is gone from my laptop, and the picture I'd saved on my phone of the footprint seems to be deleted as if it were never taken. I feel as if I'm going completely insane. This was only yesterday morning. I didn't go to work yesterday, and I probably won't today either. The thing... It came back last night, and I know this for sure. What's worse is I think it was in my house. My bedroom. I tried to sleep last night, but I was abruptly woken by what seemed like nothing at all. I quickly realized I wasn't able to move at all. I wanted to. I tried to, but I couldn't. I was lying on my side in my bed, facing the wall while unable to move, when I suddenly noticed the smell. I started to panic. I knew exactly what was in the room with me, and I could not move to save my life. I then heard the whispers of the thing. It doesn't speak like we speak. It whispers... It whispers we are of a language I've never heard before, and they didn't sound coherent whatsoever. All I remember is the terror the sounds gave me just from listening before I felt it on my bed from the direction my back was turned. I still couldn't move. But I could feel it, trying to climb its way out of my bed. I tried with all my will and strength to move and finally broke free. I jumped up as quick as I could and everything seemed to cease then and there. I realized it was daytime now that I must have slept through most of the night. There was nothing in the room with me. No whispers circled the air now, but the smell was still there. The smell's in my house now and I'm terrified. I have no idea what action to take at this point. Along with the smell, various objects from my house have gone missing. Candles, random pictures, and my rosary that I've kept in the drawer of my bedside table that's belonged to me since my childhood. I'm still terrified, which is why I'm posting this account. I've done some research on what the cause may be, and I've come up with silly results such as sleep paralysis or psychosis. This all seems too real to me to be of any natural explanation. I think I'm dealing with something supernatural and demonic. I've ordered a set of surveillance cameras that should arrive tomorrow, assuming I'm still alive and somewhat sane. I feel like I'm living in a house out of the paranormal activity movies, only it's real and naturally much more disturbing. I'll hopefully report back with accounts of what I've seen on the new cameras and what I've myself witnessed in the next few days. If nothing is heard from me after this account, please just assume the worst. Her family had lived in that house, on that street, for as long as Ivana could remember. She had her birthday parties in that backyard, then swung from the big tree in the front yard until the rope wore down and the metal creaked. Every Christmas morning, her and her brothers gathered on the floor before the tree, and every Easter, they sat back on the porch and dyed eggs to fill with confetti and glitter. Their walls were covered in both old and new photos, some black and white, some faded sepia, and others from the weekends previous. It had always seemed to smell of her grandmother's flowery perfume and smoke from their small wood-burning fireplace. Not too big, but big enough, as her father always said. It was home, serving as the backdrop for every fond memory she held dear. Well, them and a less pleasant one. Having lived in that neighborhood for so long, they'd come to be close with almost all of their immediate neighbors. To their left lived an elderly couple, Ivana knew simply as Mr. and Mrs. Herrera, 
who always sat in rocking chairs in their netted enclosed porch, and to their right lived the Campbell family. The Campbell's house was painted a lilac color, and their backyard was separated by nothing more than a chain-link fence. It had a bigger front yard, too, or at least it felt that way, since they lacked bushes or trees, which in turn led to many afternoons spent playing tag there with the Campbell kids. The youngest of them was a girl, two years older than Ivana, named Alyssa. The two were very close, and often walked to school with their arms linked as they tried to stomp in every puddle or kick as much snow off the sidewalk as they could. Alyssa was at every one of those birthday parties without fail, and Ivana climbed over the fence to join every one of hers. They agreed that nothing could ever separate them, and someday they may even move away together. The best thing was, in their minds, the fact that their bedroom windows were both on the sides of their respective house, facing each other. The two of them would sit in the window sills, perched like birds, and spend many hours talking by writing on notebooks and holding them up for each other to see. They'd give each other's attention late at night with a few flickers of a flashlight and reveled in the disobedience and perceived danger of it all, should they be found awake. Gossip homework, answers, anything to preoccupy each other until they were too tired to stay awake. Ivana looked forward to it every night, especially on days when chores and schoolwork kept her out of the yard. Snowy and sick days were by far the worst, and she sought comfort in leaning against the glass with her flashlight in hand. Alyssa was her best friend, and she loved her. Alyssa, unfortunately didn't stick around as long as she had planned. That warm summer morning when the moving truck pulled up in front of the lilac house, the two girls were heartbroken. Neither had known that far in advance, and when the news had been broken to them, it was taken with the hopeless sort of sadness that came with the inevitable. It rained that afternoon, and Alyssa stood in her window with her backpack over one shoulder, waving goodbye. She wasn't crying and Ivana smiled back with as much reassurance as she could muster. After her friend had gotten into the car and drove away with all her family's belongings in tow, however, all she could do was cry into her pillow so nobody would hear. She was a big girl, after all. No, Mommy, it's okay. We're going to call and write letters. She'll do it, she promised. The house was empty for a long while growing weeds while remaining vacant and silent. They stayed out of the front yard and only went over to pick the for sale sign back up when it would fall over. Winter blanketed the house in snow that was left untarnished by footsteps until spring. The lawn turned brown under the summer sun without someone to water it in the evenings, and school started back up again and Ivana had only received one letter and two phone calls from her old friend. They didn't know what to talk about either time. She wouldn't have noticed a for sale sign go down if it wasn't for her brother Thomas's suspicious tendencies. Thomas had said multiple times that he'd seen people going in and out, but their parents insisted that they kept keeping an eye out and had seen nothing. When he pointed the now empty yard out to their father, he shrugged and suggested that maybe someone was moving in. They never saw a moving truck or the big spectacle that accompanied new tenants. The red pickup truck was just there one day. At first it appeared that only one person had moved in. A man with a thick white mustache and thinning silver blonde hair would occasionally leave to go and buy groceries, and sometimes he would just pace the porch in the evenings with a beer can in one hand, wearing nothing but a wife beater and a pair of grimy jeans. He introduced himself reluctantly in passing once as Douglas. Ivana didn't like the way his gaze lingered on her when he noticed her standing there. Sometimes she'd go out and swing, only to go inside promptly after noticing him in the window, looking out, or at the screen door. He looked like he couldn't figure out what she was, like she was some identifiable animal prowling about the property. One late night, something else happened that she found unsettlingly odd. She lay in bed, half awake when something in the window of Alyssa's old room caught her attention. It was a tiny flicker, not like a flashlight, but more the reflection of light of something else. 
She sat up, convinced it was a trick of the memory and light. The flickering was a deliberate uh, pattern of varying durations, and something was moving ever so slightly between the half-drawn curtain and the darkness of the supposedly vacant room. Sliding out from under the cover, she made her way to the window and cupped her hands around her eyes for a clearer look. The room wasn't vacant at all. A girl a few years younger than her stood almost out of sight with a compact mirror in her hand. She was using the glow of the street lamp and waved excitedly when she was noticed. She moved forward and began to mouth something unintelligible as Ivana reached for her notebook in response. Hey there, who are you? The girl looked confused and didn't appear to understand either what was written or what the question was. She stared blankly at her a moment before she mouthed a simple question. Name? Ivana nodded, urging her to answer. She pointed to herself and mouthed Ivana as well as she could before pointing to the girl for her response. Marissa. After a few tries, Ivana turned back to the notebook and held it up long enough for the girl to decipher. It's nice to meet you, Marissa. Marissa nodded happily and smiled a wide, toothy grin. She was missing a few front teeth, but didn't seem to mind. Soon they'd be back, seeing that adult teeth were beginning to peek out of her gums. It was nothing unusual for her age. She pointed out and then held up two fingers. The message was clear. You too. Before she could write anything more, Marissa's head turned and she suddenly looked flustered. She turned back, only to wave before slipping back out of sight. This left Ivana slightly rattled, wondering if this was something normal or not. Some people were just shy, she knew, and she didn't want to make mountains out of molehills, but the encounter left her uncomfortable. It wasn't the last time Marissa appeared in the window. She'd stand there waiting for her new friend to notice and come to the window. She only appeared at night at first, which allowed the I'm tired, got to sleep half excuse to be used. Only the sad look on Marissa's face made her insides writhe with guilt. It was difficult to talk, since she never had any paper and wouldn't open the window because there was a house alarm installed, so the conversations were quite brief. The girl's voice was a mystery for the longest time. Soon she was there during the day, too which made things less unsettling and more uncomfortable. The window would slide open at around 9 in the morning, and if she was anywhere in sight, Marissa would call her name. Sometimes she threw little pebbles at the glass until she came to look. She spoke too fast and asked too many questions, which Ivana politely answered until an excuse popped up. It made her feel like a horrible sort of friend. Do you have a dog? My dad's allergic to pet fur or something. What are you doing? Homework? Oh, yeah, spelling's really hard. Really, really hard. What took you so long to get home? Do you walk or ride a bus? I like the bus. You want to play something? I have a lot of dolls. You want to come over and play? I have lots of games we could play. For someone with so many questions, however, there was one that she refused to answer herself, which made Ivana even more suspicious. One afternoon, while unpacking the necessary supplies to complete her homework, Marissa asked her what she did at school and continued to pry in details. Swallowing hard to push back the apprehensiveness, she turned and asked, Where do you go to school, Marissa? I've never seen you at mine. The girl in the window looked as if she were suddenly put on a stage with a spotlight on her face. I used to go to a private school by Mom's house, but... Dad's been homeschooling me or something. Really? Is it fun staying home? Sure, I guess. She tilted her head as if listening, then her eyes widened in surprise. What's wrong? Nothing. My dad's calling me. I'll see you later. That evening at dinner, she brought up Marissa to her parents. She told them everything about her, all the questions and the weird feelings she got. She admitted how she'd been actively avoiding her and sneaking around so she wouldn't see her. At first, her parents didn't seem to worry, seeing that their new neighbor was just a little nosy. 
Thomas seemed more interested, and she could tell by his face that he was as more curious than anything else. After dinner, he asked if he could see Marissa, and there wasn't any logical reason she should answer no. But when they tried to get her attention, they found that night she didn't come to the window. Thomas made sure the window was locked before going back to his own room. A week passed, and they waited for the strange neighbor friend. A week passed, and Marissa was nowhere in sight, and neither of them had any desire to go knocking on the door with Douglas inside. Maybe she's imaginary. I'm too big for imaginary friends. Finally, on a particularly cold evening, she saw the flicker from the window once again. The window was indeed open, but only enough for Marissa to whisper through. She looked all right, albeit a little tired. Hey, Ivana, you want to see something cool? What is it? I made a pillow for it. It's really fun, and it's got multiple little rooms. If you're sneaky, come over and we can play in it. Why do I have to be sneaky? Daddy doesn't like people coming over. They make messes. You won't, but he thinks you will. Where's the pillow for it? It's in the little crawl space under the living room floor, you wanna? Ivana swallowed hard. Uh, it's late. I have school tomorrow. I gotta go to bed soon. I'm sorry. It's okay. I just never have any friends over. It's like they forgot about me. I bet they didn't. Everyone's in school and... I'll ask my mom tomorrow. Marissa cracked a little smile, and for a while they sat in silence. Is Douglas your dad? Ivana asked slowly, as if she were tiptoeing around. The little girl in the window made a face she hadn't before. Her brow furrowed, and she shook her head. Douglas? Yeah, he and my dad only talked a little. He doesn't seem like neighbors much. That's not my daddy's name. Thomas wouldn't let such new information go and spent more time trying to encounter Marissa himself. He asked questions like, does she look like him? Or what else did she say about him? Still, there was no response whenever Thomas was present, even if he hid so she couldn't see him. This frustrated him greatly, and he continued to bring it up to their parents, only to be told not to spy on the neighbors. At one point, he accused his sister of making it all up because she was upset about Alyssa. On this chilly November morning, Ivana proved she wasn't making anything up. It was about 4.30 before the sun had begun to rise up into the gray winter sky. The entire family was awoken by the sound of glass shattering. She was the first to get up and figure out what had caused the noise, since all she had to do was peek out the window. The window Marissa had so frequently perched in had shattered outward, scattering shimmering shards of glass all over the weeds in the window well below. There, the dark-haired girl stood, her curly locks no longer in their neat braids, and her eyes wide with fear, or at least what she perceived to be fear. She was shaking her head, and Ivana called her name. She looked around frantically, her eyes unfocused. I can't. I can't see. It's too dark. I don't want to. I don't want to be here, please. Marissa, I'm right here. What happened? She waved her arms, but the girl only groped around blindly. I don't want to go back into the dark place. It's not fun. It's not fun. There was another indistinct thud, and then her voice was gone. Everyone rushed in shortly after, but nobody could figure out what had happened or what she was even talking about when she tried to articulate what she'd seen. That afternoon, Ivana decided to call Alyssa out in hopes of telling someone who would better understand. She sat in her windowsill, looking out as she had listened to the ringing in anticipation. Alyssa's mother answered after three attempts, sounding irritated before giving over the phone. Hey, Ivana, how are you? Something weird is happening in your house. She went into detail explaining what was happening from the first night to that morning, and her old friend only listened in a nervous silence. 
It was only after Ivana mentioned Marissa's offer to join her in the crawl space pillow fort that Alyssa spoke up. Wait, she said she was playing in the crawl space? Mm-hmm. She wanted me to go and see it. It was under the living room floor. You've been to my house, though. We, we have a basement just like yours. No crawl space. Really? Oh, yeah. He was staring all around as if afraid someone would sneak up on him, then jumped in and drove away. She went hopping down the stairs, eager to tell Thomas, only to find her father sitting on the couch, leaning forward to focus all attention on the news report. Hey, honey, isn't that... Her mother came running in, and they all stared in horror as the breaking news ribbon moved across the screen and the photo of a man with a thick white mustache and silver blonde hair was put on screen. The local reporter spoke with grim urgency. Police are searching for 55-year-old Douglas Hume, who was the primary suspect in the murder of Sandra and Anthony Mitchell, as well as the abduction of their 7-year-old daughter. After neighbors reported a foul smell coming from the attached duplex where Hume had previously lived, police found the Mitchell's remains buried in the crawl space after having been missing for nearly four months. Police believe that Hume is tied to multiple robberies and abductions all over the state. He's considered to be armed and very, very dangerous. If you have any information concerning the whereabouts of Mr. Hume, please call this number on the screen. Ivana watched in shock as her mother snatched the phone from her hands and darted to the kitchen to dial the number. I had managed to keep a healthy skepticism of ghosts, ghouls, and all things supernatural until I was 28. I found most claims of such things to be dubious at best and harmful at worst. I was very much in the camp of the classical sciences, as I'd studied physics at Edinburgh University several years earlier. While my profession has never taken me back into the scientific arena, I had, until this time, maintained a ruthless opposition to the pseudoscience and superstition. My friends often wonder about the change they saw in me at the time. What surprised them was that it wasn't a slow, steady change of heart, but rather a complete turnaround overnight. A transformation, if you will. It may have appeared as if it occurred so very quickly, but in fact, it happened over a slightly longer time scale. Two weeks, to be precise. It was February. In fact, it was the week of Valentine's Day. Around this time, I was going through a uh, socially isolated phase. It's something which often happens in the bleak Scottish winters, where I become increasingly wrapped up in my own loneliness and passing bitterness at those who fit in. It was, and still is, a neurotic hangover for my teenage years, one which had plagued me for far too long. Two weeks earlier, I'd found myself wandering through the cobbled streets of Edinburgh to clear my head. Walking, as amusing as it may seem, has always been a great comfort to me. You are, in every sense, alone with your thoughts. But that part of you which craves the company of others is slightly appeased by being in the world, even if you're only in it long enough to share a glance with a passing stranger. Edinburgh is a very old city and has remarkably kept much of its former self. The cobbled streets meander down the steep side of what was once a volcano, breaking off sporadically into narrow lanes which occasionally open up into secluded courtyards. These numerous courtyards are often flanked on all sides by tall terraced houses, huddled together as if whispering of a secret of a long-forgotten past. The impressiveness of it all as a city is often lost on those who lived here long enough to find beauty commonplace. As often happens when gripped by depression, I hadn't been sleeping well. I'd finished work the previous evening around 5 p.m., and while I managed to get a few hours sleep, my mind just wouldn't let me relax. Come 6 in the morning, even though it was a Sunday and I could for once have a long lie, I conceded defeat in my attempts to have a proper rest, and got up to greet the world, however reluctantly. 
By the time I set out, it was still early morning, and the cold January air stung my face. Although Edinburgh is, for want of a better expression, a tourist city, at the time it still seemed relatively deserted, even for a Sunday. A slight mist had risen out of the water of Leith, making it feel all the more colder as I passed through the narrow lanes and down empty pavements, entirely oblivious to where I was going. As the shop opened and the first trickle of tourists bled out into the cobbled walkways from their hotels, I deliberately headed for a quieter, often forgotten, network of streets. My wandering mind had indeed taken over, for as I broke through the haze of a daydream, I found myself standing at the gates of an old graveyard. I'd been thinking of turning back and heading home, but something about this place awoke a compulsion in me. I had to explore it. I found it curious that the gates, constructed out of blackened steel rods, were lying unlocked as early in the day as this. Entering the cemetery, I immediately noticed the overall isolation of the place, enjoying the sound of gravel under my feet, which pierced the silence as I moved slowly along a path littered with small white stones. It wasn't a large graveyard. It seemed to consist of two separate plots, with the older graves at the front bordering the fence and gate, filing backward up into a diminutive nearby hill where the more recently deceased residents lay. The oldest graves bore the weathered scars of age. I found one which was dated 1776, but the epitaph was illegible. I felt a sadness staring at that headstone, wondering about who it belonged to and indulgently contemplating about myself as a forgotten or lost soul. Eventually, I moved off, wandering up the hill toward the newer graves. I found myself drawn to a large old sycamore tree, which loomed over several graves below it with an almost protective demeanor. I stared at one of the headstones, reading the words but not registering them as my mind was engulfed by yet another daydream. The grave stood out somewhat from those around it. The headstone was white in color, while those which accompanied it were forged out of a deep black marble. Without thinking, I ran my hand over the smooth stone, feeling the occasional mark of the elements upon it. At the foot of the headstone lay a small, innocuous vase. It was made of a brownish metal, copper. I assumed, as the surface exhibited small veins which were blue in color due to its exposure to the weather. As I stood there, something rose up out of my mind, something which bothered me greatly. At first, I did not know what it was. Experiencing it merely as a low, growing sense of discomfort. As this feeling of unease reached a crescendo, I suddenly realized what was wrong. The name on the grave was Lisa Main. I knew that name well. Everyone in the local area did. I'd known her when I was growing up, as we went to the same school together. She was someone that I watched from afar, full of life and exuberance while I was shy reclusive, and reserved. I possessed that intense infatuation and desire for her which only a first love can produce. The words on her headstone came into sharp focus. Age 15. I was overcome with a tremendous sense of grief and loss, one which took me entirely by surprise, so much so that I had to leave that place. I just... I couldn't bear it. As someone who prides himself on being level-headed and 
Immune to flights of fancy, I cannot shake the profound unease which often comes with outrageous coincidence. I exited the graveyard as quickly as possible and headed home, ignoring the now cluttered ember streets. I did not look back. Over the following few days or so, I was preoccupied. I was overworked and was having trouble sleeping, but that was not unusual for me. What was unusual were the immovable thoughts and memories of Lisa Maine, thoughts which now stayed with me wherever I would go. I'd been terribly affected by her death as we were only 15 years old at the time, but that was over a decade ago and I had not thought of her for many years. It was as if seeing that gravestone had awoken a sense of loss, a sense of pain, which I'd managed to bury so far deep inside of me that I persuaded even myself to forget it. A cacophony of memories now haunted me, beautiful and terrifying. At any moment, I would be exhilarated by the thought of her smile, her hair, her kindness, and at the very next, engulfed by despair at the image of her lying under six feet of earth, cold and alone. Once full of life, now a decaying husk which had long ago housed that beautiful soul. If I had told anyone how I felt, they would have called me overly emotional, sentimental, for the fact remained I barely knew Lisa. Watching her for years across a classroom, I imagined myself talking with her, sharing those intoxicating moments which mean so much to a teenager. The first connection with someone that you adore, the first feeling of being loved, the first kiss. I had, in fact, hardly ever spoken to her until only a few weeks before she died. In one of those embarrassing maneuvers which teachers often pull, the pupils were all forcefully partnered with someone to take our first social dance. Social dancing was a torrid affair. For someone like Lisa, it was fun to be enjoyed, while for me, it was something to be detested. I was embarrassed, possessing none of the talent to be a dancer, and even more so afraid to spend time with a girl held back by my own teenage awkwardness. It was the end of January, and Lisa quickly set me at ease in social dancing class where we practice. I cannot convey the simultaneous sense of joy and fear which I felt when she asked me to walk her home that day. Some people find social interactions to be exhausting, much like myself, always worried about saying the wrong thing, but some individuals can set others at ease with the smallest of effort. Lisa was one of those people. As we walked across an elegantly Victorian bridge toward her house, the winter sun bathed our surroundings in a cool, comforting glow. I could have been more content to be in the presence of this happy, kind-hearted girl. She was so beautiful with an incredible smile and golden locks of hair which seemed more at home in a fairy tale than our surroundings. For weeks, we walked the same route home every day, talking, laughing, something I rarely did, and growing ever closer. When you're at that age, everything is so potent. Most can fall in and out of love in a heartbeat. I didn't have many friends and lived alone with my mother, who was not a particularly affectionate woman, so in that short time I fell in love with Lisa Maine. On the 13th of February, we stopped outside of her house. We stood talking for a moment and then for the first time, Lisa became distant. She stared at me in a way that she had never done before. 
I felt uneasy and yet exhilarated. There was a moment, a tiny moment, where we said nothing to one another. Then she hugged me. Her fingers slid through my hair. I'll never forget how sweet she smelled, how alive she felt, and how grateful I was to someone for showing me a kindness I had never previously known. Lisa slowly let go of me and then skipped up to her front door. Just before she disappeared, she turned and smiled at me one more time. And then she was gone. Immediately, I knew what I was going to do. For the first time in my life, I was full of purpose and focus, a desire to just do one thing. I ran as fast as I could to the local shops. I was lucky that most of them were shutting up for the day. A kind old man who ran a rarely used card store allowed me into his shop, even though it was just closing. I was going to buy my first Valentine's card. It had to be perfect. It had to be just right. After looking at almost every card I could afford, I found one. It was fate. The card was red with a white circle in the middle. And that circle was a boy and a girl walking hand in hand into the distance together. I didn't care what it said inside, because I always had a way with the written word and knew I could put something down which came from the heart. I bought it. After leaving the card shop, I went straight into my local newsagents. I'd kept aside my last two pounds. My mother gave me an allowance to buy my lunch at school every week, and I knew she would not give me more should I spend it. Despite it being I would have to go without lunch for a few days, I bought a box of chocolates to accompany the card. I rushed home, walked straight past my mother, who barely greeted me, grabbed a pair of scissors from the kitchen, and went upstairs. I knew I would get into an unbelievable amount of trouble for it, but I didn't care. I cut a slither of material from the red curtains hanging in my mother's room and tied the makeshift ribbon around the box of chocolates. In my mind... It now looked like a Valentine's gift. I wrote in the card explaining how I felt about Lisa and how much these walks home had meant to me, signed it, sealed the envelope, and slid it under the ribbon so it sat nicely with the chocolates. I waited for the next day. It came all too slowly. The 14th of February. I will never forget the excitement of getting ready for school. I took one last look at the chocolates and card before slipping them into my bag. I think I made it a little too obvious that I was carrying something important and delicate as I cradled the whole bag in my arms for most of the day. I was enthused, so focused that I was going to march straight up to Lisa and give her the gift without a care for what others, some whom who could be very cruel, would think. But she wasn't there. She wasn't in the playgrounds. She wasn't in her classes. For the subjects we shared, I just sat and stared at her empty desk and chair. School finished, and I found myself walking the same route Lisa and I would normally. I stood outside her house holding the chocolates. I can't describe the feeling I experienced there. Call it the effects of a lack of food or the exhaustion I having been so primed for the day, but anxiety took me, and as a result, I couldn't bring myself to knock on her door. I went home, dejected. I couldn't so much as eat a bite of the undercooked ham my mother threw down in front of me, so I simply went upstairs and crawled into bed, barely sleeping all night. 
For the next two days, I walked that same route and found myself holding on to those chocolates, not daring to cross the threshold of the little white fence in front of Lisa's house. On the third day, I asked the teachers about Lisa's absence, something which just hadn't occurred to me to do. I associated any authority with being cold, distant, and unfair, and as a result, normally avoided contact with my teachers at any cost. Mr. Randall, our history teacher, told me that Lisa had come down with a bad fever and was very ill. She could be off for weeks. With this news, I was resolute. I was going to knock on her door, and knock on her door was just what I did. I knocked and knocked and knocked but no one answered the next day I did the same and again no one answered it had now been five days since I'd last seen Lisa it was a Saturday and once again I went over to Lisa's house chocolates and card in hand as I approached her house, the sky clouded over, casting a dull hue over Lisa's seemingly deserted street. It was clear to see that Lisa's father was not a gardener. The garden path split an overgrown and patchy lawn in two with clambering weeds stretching up toward the sun through numerous cracks in the concrete slabs. I stopped to look around and focused my gaze on what seemed to be a smallish, Gnome figurine smothered in the undergrowth. It had sadly been broken. Many suggest that when something is wrong, a person knows. They may not be aware of precisely what has happened, but they can almost feel a palpable sense of dread in the air. I looked around and continued toward the front door. Something was different. I was sure that the house had seemed as deserted as it had on the previous days I'd visited, and while the house was, for all intents and purposes, exactly the same as before, there was one change. The front door was open. I was convinced that it had been shut when I'd arrived, but I dismissed this simply as the byproduct of my fascination with the condition of Lisa's garden. You see, I can't quite explain it, but there was something suffocating about that house on that quiet street. I reached the door and grasped the door knocker, chopping three times. No answer. I repeated my knocks more forcefully this time, but still, no one came. The door was only slightly ajar, and as such, I couldn't really see much of the interior. All I could tell was that the house was dark, and that the air escaping through the doorway was musty, as if nothing had stirred inside for days. I started to feel nervous. I didn't really know why. <clears throat> Clearing my throat and stammering slightly, I asked, Hello? Several times, without an answer. The street was empty. The whole place felt devoid of life. And then a thought began to ruminate and gather momentum within me. What if Lisa, or her father, were hurt? I started to play out all the possibilities in my mind. The two of them lying somewhere in the house, injured without food or water for days. Then I remembered that my history teacher had said Lisa was ill. He must have spoken to someone to know this, probably Lisa's father. I'd hoped that she was not so sick that her father had taken to the hospital. To 
Despite the logic of my thoughts, I still could not dismiss the horrible feeling that something was indeed wrong. Fear began to grip me, yet I closed my eyes only for a moment and found the memory of Lisa's card and chocolates as I pushed the door fully open. It moved silently, but I was sure the noise of hitting a doorstep on the floor would alert anyone to my presence as the bang echoed throughout the house. But still, no one came. The house was bathed in darkness. I took one last look around and crossed the threshold. While Lisa did not come from an affluent family, the house had an upstairs and must have had at least four bedrooms with an attic. Perhaps the fact that Lisa was an only child made the house seem all the larger and emptier, but as I slowly made my way down the hallway, I felt as if each footstep echoed throughout distant passages and rooms. Beginning with the living room on the ground floor, I moved from room to room, occasionally asking if anyone could hear me. But I quickly became aware that I was talking to myself. The air was stiflingly hot, and running my hands across the radiator, I realized that the boiler must have been on for some time. As I moved into the kitchen at the rear of the house, I heard something. It was an almost rhythmic, dull thudding. I I couldn't identify what it was, but I knew that it was coming from somewhere upstairs. I left the kitchen, which I was glad to do, as it was filled with the smell of rotting food, and walked to the foot of the stairs. The staircase was quite narrow and ran along the inside of a wall. At the top of the stairs was a landing which curved round to the left and led on to the other rooms. The dull thudding was now more pronounced as I slowly climbed to the stairs. The same fear which had gripped me at the door returned. The realization of wandering into someone's house uninvited came into the fore. Stopping for a moment, I closed my eyes and thought of Lisa again. Then I continued on. As I reached the top of the stairs, the thudding noise stopped. I shudder now, even just thinking of it. There were three doors leading to the other bedrooms and one leading to a bathroom, which I could already see was empty. The door to the first bedroom lay open. I peered in slowly, almost expecting to find someone there. There was no one. It was Lisa's father's room, neat, organized, with almost no objects of any note. The only curiosity was that the curtains were not drawn. The door to the second room was closed. Again... I was overcome with a sense of intrusion. I was walking around in someone's house without invitation. In effect, I was a trespasser. I knocked on the door quietly. Waiting for a moment, I realized the room must be empty and turned a brass handle on the door. As I pushed the door, it creaked, then suddenly stopped after only a few inches of movement. Something was behind the door. I pulled it toward me and then pushed again, but no luck. With each attempt, the wooden door bashed off of something. I suddenly became aware of the noise I was making as each attempt echoed through the house. It was not dissimilar to the thudding I'd heard before. I tried one more time, pushing against the obstacle as hard as I could. No luck. I was about to give up and move on to the next door when I saw what was blocking my entrance. I will never 
forget the cold, glassy stare of the face which seemed to be peeking out from behind the bottom of the door. The skin, a pallid gray, the few retreating locks of hair covering an otherwise balding head, globules of sweat congealed under. Most of its features were obscured by the door, but the only visible eye still stared, clouded and covered in shadow. I didn't scream. Because I quickly realized that not only was this the face of Lisa's father, but that he was very much dead. I felt numb, but looking back I realized I handled the situation much more calmly than many of my age would have. But I did have... A strange fascination for such things, reading many accounts of quite horrific death scenes. I stared for a moment, composed myself, and then instantly turned to thoughts of Lisa and where she might be. Was she in the same room? Was she in the attic? All I could do was hope that she was okay. Something then happened, an event which I have to this day repressed, ignored, and avoided as much as I possibly could. Something which shook me to the core, something which I have never told a soul. The face staring up at me through that gloom-filled gap in the doorway moved. At first it was only slight, and I disregarded it as the effects of shock, but then it moved again. Suddenly the door began to shake violently, as if being punched and kicked by the body lying behind it. The head turned upward as the cracking of rigor mortis from the neck struggled against each sharp and vicious movement. A putrid, gurgling sound gasped out and raged from deep within its bloated throat. I closed my eyes. I was sure it wasn't real. And the banging stopped, and the house fell once again into silence. I let out a sigh of relief and opened my eyes. What I saw, I can barely describe now. The face had moved upward from behind the door to be level with mine. The door shook and rattled under the strain as its venomous attacker tried to claw and batter its way through. Finally, the face pushed and squeezed through the gap in the door, revealing its repulsively loathsome features in their entirety. Dead, swollen with clotted blood, gasping relentlessly for air, all the time staring straight at me through hate-filled eyes, with lips pulled back over teeth, gritted together, grinding against one another in wretched hatred. I do not know much of what took place after that. Perhaps I'm glad to, but I know I escaped, and I know I ran home, confused, crying, babbling like a madman. I also know one more thing. While the memory has been pushed so deep inside that I can barely recognize it, I know whatever was in that room slipped through the gap in that doorway, slipped through and grabbed me. How I escaped, I don't know. The truth was more horrifying than I could have ever imagined. Lisa's father had lost his job a couple of weeks earlier, and his bills mounted, combined with the pressures of looking after his only child, he snapped. When the police entered the house, they found poor, sweet Lisa's body in the cellar, her wrists tied to a radiator. She'd been strangled to death. 
After killing his daughter, Lisa's father then went upstairs and hanged himself in her room. After a few days of hanging there, the cord he used to choke the life from himself seemed to have snapped. The police found his body slumped behind the bedroom door. The door was open. As time eroded the memory, the explanation of these events altered greatly. Through my years of study at school and in university, I read of psychological pressures and how trauma could bring about vivid hallucinations. I convinced myself that I'd found Lisa's father dead and that the shock had produced the rest of the experience. No matter how real it felt, the idea that a corpse, twisted by rage and hate, perhaps even by the love for his daughter, could somehow come back to life and attack the living just did not fit in with my scientific and atheistic understanding of the world. I dismissed the entire experience. But one thing had still managed to haunt me until I managed to hide it from myself. The police reported that Lisa had been tied up for a couple of days before she was killed. The date of her death was recorded as the 15th of February. She'd been in that cellar, tied up, frightened, yet alive when I'd come by to give her Valentine's gift. People talk about hauntings and spirits, but the memory of that contorted face rising up through the doorway was nothing compared to the knowledge that had I went into her house that day that maybe, just maybe, I could have saved her. I know I was a child, but I could have done something. I grew up, but I never felt that same love again, that feeling of a connection with another human being. I developed an unhealthy attachment to my own company and found myself more interested in burying my head in textbooks than perhaps meeting others or even falling in love. The friends that I did have were never that close to me, nor did they ever truly understand who I was. Seeing Lisa's grave had brought it all flooding back to me. Those stolen moments, that thing in the house, her death. The funny thing is that of all those memories, both traumatic and precious, the one thought which would not leave me was of the Valentine's gift I never gave. While I still hoped that the dead thing in Lisa's house was of my own imagination and that the world was still very much material, lacking in the spiritual, I still felt the need to rectify this. I'd kept the card all those years. In many ways, it was both my most cherished and loathed possession cherished for the memories which it drew up from within me and loathed for the same reason. On the morning of the 14th, I walked through the cobbled streets of Edinburgh towards Lisa's resting place, and on the way I stopped at a little news agent's and picked up a box of chocolates. On my first visit, I'd wandered there by accident vaguely negotiating each street in a daze, but this time I was focused and resolute. Sentiment is a curious thing, and it had encouraged me to keep not only the card, but also the ribbon I'd made for the chocolates. When I entered the graveyard, I gazed up toward that lonely hill where she lay. I felt hesitant. Not because I didn't want to leave the gifts by her graveside, but more so because I did not know the extent to which the feelings of remorse, sadness, and bitter nostalgia would overcome me again. Nevertheless, I took a moment and then made my way up over the widened path, up toward the hill, up toward her. 
and there I stood. The sun was still relatively low in the sky, and it cast long, contorted, and exaggerated shadows over everything. After standing there for what seemed like an age, I pulled out the ribbon, tied it carefully around the box, and then placed the chocolates and the card against the cold headstone. I don't know if I said anything. At the time, I probably didn't, as I was still convinced that she wasn't there to hear me. That once your loved ones pass away, they are gone forever. And that death is the end. I do know that I cried. I cried like I hadn't since I was a child and fell to my knees and buried my head in my hands. I was inconsolable. Those moments of utter sadness, utter despair at the cruelness of life and what it had done to beautiful Lisa were the last I had as a true skeptic, for as I knelt there, the wind blew gently through the graveyard, gently caressing those stone markers of loss and those who attended them. I'd heard and read about people having religious or spiritual experience, and while I cannot truly accept others' testimonies, I can say that what I felt at that moment was profound. An achingly beautiful feeling of compassion and love. Looking around, no one was there, but I felt that someone was. I tried to shake the feeling off as my mind simply playing tricks on me, but no matter how much I tried to stick to that interpretation of events, I simply could not do it. That feeling shared a twin emotion. I'd only once ever felt that way before. When Lisa hugged me the last time I saw her. As the sensation washed over me, I realized that I'd truly been searching for that same feeling again, but never found it until that moment. I stood up, wiped my eyes, and touched the gravestone as if to say goodbye. I walked to the graveyard entrance with a smile which stretched from ear to ear, something anyone who knows me will tell you is extremely unusual. When I reached the gate, I glanced once more at that hill which for me was no longer a sight of loneliness, but one of love and friendship. The second and last time I can say I've ever seen a ghost was at that moment, for standing up on the hill beside Lisa's grave was the blurry image of a young girl in a pink social dancing dress. I didn't run to the grave because... I knew I did not have to. She waved slowly at me, then disappeared behind her gravestone. I walked home. I felt full, joyful, and exuberant. It's almost impossible to describe the experience by the graveside. Perhaps completeness will do for now, but even that cannot convey it. Friends wonder what happened to me around that time. The truth is, I found something I did not know that I was missing. Some of you listening to this may think that I found my faith, but it was not that at all. What I found that day was companionship and acceptance from the only person I'd ever truly loved. I knew from that day onward that the world was a far more mysterious and wonderful place than I could have ever possibly imagined. I knew that I would never fear being alone, for when I go wandering through the streets of Edinburgh, I find myself on a quiet stretch of road. I smile to myself, knowing that if I listen carefully, I can hear the footsteps of Lisa, the girl that I loved so dearly when I was a child, walking with me wherever I go.